Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 15th meeting of 2019. There are no apologies. Agenda item one is our first evidence panel at the start of our short inquiry into secure care and mental health services for young people in our penal and care system. I'm pleased to welcome Wendy Sinclair Gieben and Dr. Helen Smith to our meeting. I refer members to paper one and two, which are public papers, and paper three, which is a private paper. However, before we begin, I, I would like to take this opportunity to express the committee's sincere condolences to the family and friends of both Katie Allen and William Lindsay, young people who so tragically died in custody. I now invite um, Chief Inspector of Prisons to make a few short opening remarks about a review in mental health services at Pullman Young Offenders Institution, and then we'll move to questions. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to give evidence. I'm very grateful. Secondly, I, I need to make clear that I think any young person who dies in custody is a tremendous tragedy for the family and for Scotland as a whole. Um, and my sympathies go out. I don't know if you know, but my father committed suicide and I have an absolute understanding of the misery and tragedy that can cause. So... The Mental Health Review was commissioned, as you know, following the deaths of William Lindsay and Katie Allen, but specifically excluded our looking at those two cases. In reality, we did not look at any individual case, as we felt that a case review wasn't the, within the terms of reference. So what became clear in all our evidence, and we did a considerable degree of work in a very short time frame, so we talked to families, we talked to children, we talked to young people in custody, we talked to young people in Grampian prison who had been in Pullman. I visited two secure area centres to have a look and see at the difference there. Um, we did a huge clinical review, which Helen will be able to talk about more than I can. Uh, we did a considerable amount of work. There are areas of work that we were not able to complete because of the time frames. So, for instance, one of the areas of concern for me was a matching up of the FAI determinations and recommendations with the recommendations from the DIPLAR, the Death in Prison Review that happens. And that's a piece of work that I'd still like to complete. Um, what came out were two clear areas. One was the inconsistency or patchiness of information that actually arrived in Pullman with the child or young person. The second thing that became clear was that all the evidence, the academic evidence, and I've read more than I really want to know, is that social isolation is one of the key indicators towards being at risk. And since we have in Scotland a culture of remand prisoners not being given the same opportunities as a convicted prisoner, for very good reason, um, nonetheless, social isolation is a real issue. So those two issues came out. Now, let me be clear that we did a lot of things. So we commissioned um, University of Glasgow to do the academic evidence review, and their report is within our report. We formed three short life working groups. The first one looking at information flows, the second one looking at everything clinical and well-being, and the third one looking at the death in prison learning audit review and the, the, the existing strategy for self-harm. All of those three working groups were started by or initiated by a round table where we invited, well, frankly, the world and its brother to give us advice as to how to take this review forward. One of the other interesting things for me was how complex it was to find out all the other reviews that were going on at the same time or had recently been completed, who chaired them, who was chairing them, and what their recommendations were and whether or not they'd been fulfilled. So one of my recommendations that you'll read is for a centralised coordinating body run by Scottish Government that can actually say when you're starting a review or a task force or whatever else, here's the toolkit 
that you can use, and this is where you can access the information that has gone ahead of you. I was constantly aware that I may be treading on toes all the time for people who had already completed a major piece of work. So, that's a quick, very brief canter through. And a very helpful canter through. Uh, we now move to questions, starting with Jenny Gorruth. And good morning to the panel. Um, I'd like to start this morning by getting a better understanding of the mental health needs of young people when they first enter custody. Um, and I note in the report that you speak about um, the impact of adverse childhood experiences, and you've spoken already this morning about social isolation. Have the mental health needs of young people changed over time in recent history, do you think? I really couldn't answer that, but I'm sure Dr Smith can. Morning. I suppose from my clinical viewpoint, there has been an increase in young people with neurodevelopmental disorders, um, particularly ASD and ADHD. Also, as you've pointed out, the ACEs and yeah. young people with traumatic backgrounds and trauma histories. So I think pe young people entering custody, when we looked at it in the secure care estate, which is where I do most of my work, there was a big increase in the number of young people with mental health difficulties. Whether they met criteria for a mental health diagnosis is maybe different, but I would suggest all the young people that come into custody would have difficulties of one and, type and, or another. And on average, would be much more likely to have experienced some form of trauma in their life. Oh, yes, presumably. yes, yeah. definitely. Okay. I'm uh, certain that the, the reduction in the number of children coming into prison has meant that those who do come in are likely to have more of a complex, traumatised background. Okay. Um, you mentioned about inconsistent information in, in your opening statement there. I was quite taken by that. I note in the uh, executive summary of your report that you say, uh, during the inspection of HMP YOI Pullment, we found that the wellbeing opportunities afforded for young people were evidence-based, leading edge and impressive. However, the take-up of the remarkable opportunities remained consistently poor. Why do you think that was the case? It's a combination of reasons that we've looked at quite extensively. Um, so one of them is the young person's own wishes. They'd prefer and feel safer saying it's staying in their room. Why do they feel safer? I, don't, I can't experience that. Certainly when you speak to young people about coming into prison, they feel very nervous. Then when they're in, and Pullman's very good at having a peer mentoring system, they talk to other prisoners there and they start to relax. But I think there is that fear of the unknown, dealing with the trauma of coming into prison, and they just want to stay in their room. They don't want to come out. So it's a, it's a difficult one. But certainly it's improved. Originally, the initial inspection report showed that 50% of the places weren't taken up, and now it's down to 30%. So that's a progress. Dr. Smith? I'm not sure I can add much to that. It may be some elements of their mental health, but I think it's much more as Wendy saying. Okay. And in terms of those wellbeing opportunities, do those include educational opportunities? They certainly do. A range of educational opportunities that are really excellent. And can I ask, are those educational opportunities benchmarked against Curriculum for Excellence? Because an eighth of Curriculum for Excellence is dedicated to health and wellbeing. It would be interesting to find out if that's the case in Pullman at the moment, if that's been delivered across the piece. Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you. I wonder before I bring some others in if I could ask you, um, uh, Dr Smith, did I pick you up correctly in, 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 uh, in you saying that everyone that came into Pullman had mental health issues? I think it's very likely that a very high number of them will have mental health difficulties. Mm -hmm. Whether they have a, a diagnosable mental health disorder is very different. Right, and there's never an exception to that because we know that people go to Pullman for a number of reasons and with a number of, uh, with different backgrounds to, to how they arrive there. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're suggesting that young people maybe who are remanded or, or have other difficulties, they, they can still have difficulties, that might be why they've impacted mm -hmm. on their offending behaviour. Um, it, and they've usually had ACEs of one description or another, so it would be unlikely that there wouldn't be something for them. Uh -huh. Whether it's of the level that needs a mental health input is debatable. And so is there an assessment when someone comes in at first to establish... Yes. Uh, uh, uh -huh. Yeah. And for those that perhaps don't, can, is there a different path? I mean, that could be developed quite easily as a result of the trauma of being in 
um, as security unit? As Wendy was saying, there's the peer mentor scheme, there's the youth workers, which were very highly represented and thought of within the young people in Paulmont. There's all the wellbeing services, there's peer support, there's lots of support if you don't need the mental health team. Okay, thank you. Um, who's next? Rona. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, if I could just follow up on that sort of line of questioning, um, Dr. Smith, can you give us an assessment of whether you think there is enough mental health, what the mental health services provision is like for young people with significant mental health problems? Um, what, what, do, what do they need most and, and, and is it there for them? Are we talking now about in Pullmont or secure care? Because I know we're well, looking at both today. Pull, pull in Pullmont. The moment, yeah. the, there is a good access to services, which is better access than it is in the community. They, they're seen within eight days on average, which is really quite good compared to the community. There is nursing input, there's psychology input, there's psychiatry input. So there's quite a wide range of disciplines there that can help support them. I think some of the other aspects of care interfere with nursing staff in particular being able to do what they would like to be doing. There's lots of medication that needs to be dispensed mm -hmm. and that takes up quite a long time in an establishment as large as Pullman, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So that restricts some of the activities they can do with some of the interventions that were available. Also, before the review and the inspection, there was no psychology input for young people under the age of 18 in Pullmont. That has now resolved and there is a, a psychologist available for them. So that gap in service has been filled. And when they're, they, they first um, come into Pullmont, are you adequately informed of their needs and their, their medical background and, and mental health history? That's very variable. Um, in my experience, there's been some young people, particularly if they're sentenced, that come in with a lot of information. If young people are remanded, it can be very, very little information. Um, so it's very variable. Is that something you feel could be improved with more Definitely. interaction? Yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. OK. Can I just um, ask about the social isolation um, aspect, which obviously you've, you've mentioned and features highly. Um, can you maybe just explain what, how that can exacerbate um, young people who are experiencing trauma or just even you know, the fact that they're in there. And also, what, what do you think could be done to you know, sort of alleviate that? And, and what, what, what measures could be taken to avoid that, that for them? Uh, I think that might be a joint answer. I'll, I'll, maybe, yeah, I'll maybe start off with, with the effect that it may have on, on their mental state. Obviously, um, if you're left alone with no activity, you're left alone with your thoughts, you can ruminate, you can become quite negative in your thinking, you're not having any form of distraction whatsoever from those negative thoughts, so it can really can impact on your mental state and how you feel about things. In terms of resolving that, uh, Wendy has made some recommendations. I've made a vast number of recommendations. <laughs> My apologies. I tried to reduce the recommendations to seven with suggestions underneath, but inevitably we end up with something like 81. <laughs> um, I, th I think there are ways and means. The primary one is legislation, which implies that remand prisoners are not allowed or not required to work, and that, that term required means that when the member of staff says, come on, come out of your room, time to come out, come and mix, come and do things, it's great fun, go and pat the dogs, you know, do whatever it is. And uh, they go, no, no, I don't have to. I'm on remand, I don't have to. Whereas in reality, we need to remove that required to work and recognise that people should have some degree of coercion to come out of their room, take advantage of the opportunities, go to induction, do all of those things. So that's a, a legislation one. The second one for me is in-cell technology. I think being... If you think of young people, you know, those of us who've got teenagers, they're welded to their phones. You know, you're taking that away from them, but also you're taking away their primary vehicle for communication. And so if you are distressed at night, currently you can ring a bell and somebody will come and give you a phone to phone Samaritans. That requires a level of sort of self-help seeking behavior. Whereas, in fact, if you can just phone a helpline, phone your family, phone all the rest of it from your room without having to stigmatise yourself, I think that would be a huge benefit. And I would certainly say it's a quick win. 
Would that pose any? I mean, I understand exactly what you're saying, but would that pose any risks as well to having having a phone? Not that I can see. I can't see any difference between fo using the phone because it follows exactly the same security guidelines as the normal phone on the wing. Mm -hmm. So, supposing they phone their family and they get distressed, mm -hmm. okay? So then you might say, well, what could they do? Well, at least they can phone the helpline. Mm -hmm. They can do all that. They can still ring the buzzer and ask for staff help. That's no different than if they were distressed in their room without any access to help. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And is, is that something that, that the Scottish Prison Service could do, or does that require any kind of legislation? Or, you know, it doesn't require any no. legislation. Uh -huh. I think it needs support. Right. Support. Okay. Thank you, you, know, I, you can imagine that the red tops are going to have difficulty with it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hugh MacArthur, supplementary? Following up on, on, on that, just for clarity, I think what you're talking about is um, the availability in cell to make phone calls as opposed to allowing young people to retain mobile devices and, absolutely. and their absolutely. cells, which yeah. I think absolutely would give rise to, to wider oh, concerns yeah. in the prison board. They, they are cordless phones, yeah. but they have to dial in their PIN number and then they can only dial the numbers that they've already been agreed they're allowed to use. So very safe. Right. The other advantage, of course, is that staff can listen in to the ones that are happening in the middle of the night, which is when most people get very distressed. Um, and can think, all right, we need to go and help. So. That, I mean, that's a model that's, I think, been piloted in, yes. in prisons, uh, or some prisons, but south of the border. It, has there been an assessment of the impact that that, that yes. has had, and indeed the, 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 the cost implications of rolling that out yes. across the estate? And, and can you share with us the details? Sure. So the cost implications vary on the age of the prison. Where there is cabling already into the cell, the cost implications are neutral. Um, so the cost of putting it in is offset by the profits made back to the company from the number of phone calls. The number of phone calls go up hugely, inevitably. You know, rather than having to queue for a phone, worrying about how your wife's labour is going, you can just go in your room and phone, and you can be, do it in private. Um, and as a result, uh, the, the, the company that installs them, and it varies on the company, actually makes sufficient money that it pays itself off after two years. So it's worth doing. Uh, what's interesting is I put it into a juvenile prison with 400 juveniles and thought, oh, how much is this going to cost us? In reality, at the end of a year, no phones were damaged. Our levels of violence went down 40% and our levels of self-harm went down dramatically. So That's helpful. Okay, Daniel. Thank you. And can I also just begin by thanking you for your report? I and mean, it's extremely extensive and, and, and very detailed. So forgive me if I get some of that detail wrong. Not all of it has uh, 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 been fully digested. But I'm quite interested in the provision of mental health services. I, I feel, in a sense, there's a bit of a mixed picture. Um, I, I think you talk in, in uh, very complimentary terms about the initial assessment that's made uh, with the nurse uh, and, and in terms of the, the TTEM programme uh, having the right intent, but there's also elements where you talk about that being at times a tick box exercise and the lack of a strategic um, uh, uh, integration with the, the health board. Uh, so, it, am I right to conclude that there's a, 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 a mixed picture? And if so, where do you feel the gaps are in terms of that mental health provision in, in particular? Uh, my feeling, and, and I'm going to hand it over to Helen again, it's a joint answer really, is that there is a lack of a mental health strategy across Scotland for prisoners and perhaps mental health strategy for young people. So the mental health approach that they will get in the community, in secure care, in any form of residential care and in Parliament, in my opinion, should be seamless and the same. So that it doesn't matter where they're coming from or what they're coming from or where they're going to, that continuity and seamless pathway of care is really important. In reality, it's fragmented in the sense that all the different health boards do their own thing. Um, what we found in Parliament, in particular, um, was that the information transfer, say, between secure care and Parliament or community in Parliament, wasn't rapid. So a child coming in on Friday afternoon, they're unlikely to get the full information until they've done the research on Monday. So there was a Rather than being able to go click, click, we've got this person's health record, here we have it. Do you see what I mean? 
Yeah. I, I absolutely do, and I mean, I think it, it certainly echoes some of the things I've heard from people within the education sector about their frustrations about the integration with mental health services yes. that they experience. I mean, I think that's a point well made. But the one thing that also strikes me is that some of the numbers you talk uh, about in your report are striking, such as 50% of uh, young people in, in Pullman having some sort of learning difficulty or disability, likewise a third having a, a head injury, and so on and so forth, uh, and uh, a very significant number of care. M my wonder is whether or not those are actually under-reported. I mean, I, there are people in the uh, children's sector who will, who've said to me that it's as much as 80% of children have a, some experience of care, whether that's kinship care or more formally. Likewise, on learning disability, you know, I, 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 somebody with a diagnosis of ADHD, I mean, I've read academic literature which thinks that ADHD alone could account for 50% of the young offenders population, which would make that 50% figure an underestimate. I mean, would you agree that those figures are, are potentially underestimated? Uh, 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 and if so, by how much? And, and, and the, 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 the follow-on question to that is, do we need to have a, a much more proactive screening mechanism to, to detect these things, do, does too much of, of that reporting re rely on self-reporting and do we need to be more proactive in, in terms of identifying those individuals? So, yeah, I was going to say, I think that's more you than me. <laughs> yeah. uh, in answer to your second question, yes, I do think we need to be more proactive in screening for these uh, difficulties that you're suggesting. One thing that, in my clinical practice, that makes it very difficult is the transition of care. Because the young people go from secure care to Polmont to the community, to secure, they move around. And we all see the same young people, but I have to transition their care wherever they go if they're not in my area. That's not good care. It doesn't, it's not very safe in terms of transition of information. Um, so looking and being pro more proactive, I think we do need to look at that. That is probably within the remit of the, TAM, the CAMS task force, the at-risk work stream, which is looking at some of these young people. Um, so again, it's as Wendy was saying, there's, there's so many reviews that overlap. It's, it's where that is dealt with. But absolutely, we do need to be much more proactive for these young people. Can I just ask one final question, and it touches on the, the answer that, that, that Dr. Smith just gave, uh, and, and I'm going to do a, a bit of a shameless plug. Uh, in the uh, amendment stage for management vendors, one of the things I was exploring was whether or not we need to guarantee registration with a GP for people leaving uh, the prison service. I mean, do you think that is a proposal that, 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 that could help um, uh, in terms of managing that continuity of care? I think so, yeah. Whether it would be doable, yes, absolutely, but definitely. Certainly, um, some people don't know where they're going when they're leaving prison on secure care, so it, it can be difficult to know where they're going to be placed, but absolutely, there's been difficult getting uh, GPs registered, so yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Supplementary, Fulton? Yeah, yeah. A, a very brief supplementary. It's probably picking up on the, <clears throat> the, the, fi the final point there from uh, Dr Smith. Um, You'll be aware of the, uh, the task force that, that was started by Dr Dame Denise Coyer. I, I know you referred to that there, but um, I'm wondering if you found um, in your own work any potential areas uh, of overlap. And I, and I know that the, the Minister has already said last week that uh, the government and COSLA are currently looking at the recommendations now to take how, how to take that forward. I'm wondering if you've got any thoughts? From my point of view, um, I'm a great one in believing in equality of care. And there is a real disparity between the care people receive if they go to some of the secure units and if they go to Pullmont or if they're in the community. My speciality is forensic CAMS. And there's only one team in Glasgow that do that, provide that service. There's no other provision across the, Scotland. There is the Ivy Project that do cross boundaries, but they are not multidisciplinary and can only do consultation at the moment. So if you're a young person in Aberdeen, you do not get the same level of service as you would if you're in Glasgow. That goes for the secure care as well. Uh, I'm sure David Mitchell from Rossi will be telling you that there's a real equality in the care that is provided. In Glasgow, we provide an enhanced access service to CAMS to young people who are admitted to secure care. TASA, NHS TASA do not do that in Rossi, and so they do not get as much service as we do in, provide in Glasgow. 
I think there is scope to pull all that together to give a much more national picture, including Pormont, and more nationwide support for these very, very difficult, at-risk young people. Uh, but that would take more of a steer from people and a, a will willingness to do that. Okay. Okay. Uh, Shona. Thank you. Morning. Um, we have touched already uh, on the issue of interagency communication and, and working, and um, we've heard that there, first of all, there's a lack of information on the child. That that information is variable, and also the information flow isn't isn't rapid. So, looking at the uh, the the communication between uh, agencies. Um, uh, and the needs of young people who require um, multiple interventions. Is it your judgment, from what you've said, I suspect it is, that the agencies, whether it's the President's Courts, Police, NHS, local authorities, um, I take it you don't believe they work as well together as they could. So if you could confirm that, and in terms of the sharing information, what do you think needs to happen to improve that? I mean, should there be, for example, some type of mandatory protocol uh, with time frames? I mean, what is it that you think would be the solution to make sure that, first of all, that there's quality information, that that is shared, and also that it's shared rapidly? And are there any data issues in that that could hinder such a thing? Yeah, so there are. There's inevitably GDPR. It's a real issue. So there does need to be a consensus agreement between all the relevant agencies. And I think within that, there needs to be a framework that has a minimum data set that everybody signs up to, understanding what the minimum data requirements are, understanding what the standards of those minimum data set is, so that you can actually do the assurance and accountability and say, are we meeting those standards you know, of the minimum data set? I think it can be done electronically. I don't think it's an easy task. I don't think, how old, I mean, I think every agency works with the best intent, but my overwhelming feeling is that it's very hard to make decisions unless you are fully informed. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, Sometimes people are fully informed, sometimes they're not. But what surprised me was people coming into, sorry, people coming into Parliament. Um, some come in with such a comprehensive dossier of information, and some come in for whom there is a plethora of information out there, and none of it comes in with them. So, in reality, we do need that consensus agreement as to what we're going, information we're going to provide, how it's going to be transmitted, and what are the standards against which we're going to be measured against that. And does that have to be... How, how, what, what mechanisms could be used to ensure that happens? So would it have to be made mandatory? Would it have to have some kind of legislative underpinning to make it happen? Or you know, what... What needs to happen to go from where we are at the moment with that variance to that happening as standard? Other countries use a consensus agreement, so it's not a legislation, right. but it is a kind of um, agreement that we will work together. If you look at the whole systems approach, there is that combined agreement that everybody will work together and share information. It works very well. So, you know, it doesn't have to be legislation. I think. Legislation can help mm -hmm. and can assist, but uh, and is that working anywhere at the moment? That consensus agreement um, is it is it being tried here? Or? My understanding is that it is, but I would have to go back into the evidence review to confirm it. If you right. look through the evidence review, it's in there. It does talk. There's a document talking about consensus agreements. So, okay. yeah. Okay. Dr. Smith, anything to, to add? No, I don't think so. Okay. Thank you. Daniel, did you have a supplementary? Yes, I just want to ask one brief and very specific point about information sharing. I mean, we know how overrepresented care experienced children are. So is one of those bits of information is proactively asking local authorities whether or not the individual has experience of, of, of care? Because as I understand it, that is self-reported at the moment. Is that, I mean, would you agree with that? Is I would that agree with that, yeah. yeah. OK. 
Okay, Liam um, Kerr. Uh, very briefly on the uh, line of questions that Shona Robinson was taking. On this cons consensus agreement, I think what uh, Shona may have been asking, and, and I may have missed the answer, but who is going to drive that consensus agreement? Which agency says, we need a consensus agreement, everyone needs to sign up for it? On whom does the onus lie to put that in place from here? Good question. Not one I can answer for you. <laughs> right. Thank you. Okay, Fulton. Uh, thanks, Camilla. Again, it's, it's following up from uh, Shona's uh, line of questioning. Um, and probably quite a specific um, question around do, do you think there's a, a joined up approach to address the needs of children and young people when they're making that transition from a secure unit, perhaps, to Pullman? I. I think that's a very difficult question to answer, so I haven't got all the details to hand. My feeling was that there wasn't a joined up approach. Um, however, I do know that the Scottish Prison Service has been proactive with the secure care people in developing a standard operating procedure around that. So I think there now is a joined up approach, but there wasn't. Did you get a sense of how um, often um, such transitions were happening? Um, no, not for me. No. Do you have a sense? No. no it might be best, best to ask panel two. Yeah. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, I, I wonder if I could maybe uh, ask you about the level of staff absence. And um, I noticed you see in in the report that uh, the well. Uh, being opportunities were were really good, impressive, cutting edge, but there was a low um, a low take up, and this was compounded a little bit by staff absence. Could could you elaborate a little on that? Uh, sure. I think the Scottish Prison Service is undergoing significant and compelling pressure at the moment. The population rise. Um, means that staff are hugely under pressure and what happens when staff are under pressure or one of the side effects can be a high absence level. Uh, we've noted that in uh, the last four prisons that we've inspected this has been a very high absence rate. Um, that was certainly true of Parliament as well. Uh, they certainly tried to protect the well-being opportunities. Um, so what you find was that uh, Parliament moving heaven and earth to try and get the kids out and up to um, the, well, the areas where they were doing all the activities. Uh, but there were times when that was impacted. So is that something that should be looked at in contingency plans put in, especially as there's, um, there's a culture of not expecting anyone or a man to do anything? So if we, we want to extend that, and at the same time the services that are available are not being um, taken up because of staff uh, absences, and clearly it seems... I think the, the number of places lost from staff absence was small. Uh, what happened was that certain specialisms would disappear. So, for instance, if the um, people who come in and do the nurturing with the dogs, you know, if, if mm. they came in because they're outside agencies coming in, then they would move staff around to make sure that happened. But it could be that staff absence impacted on, say, a group that was happening in the chaplaincy, and that would be lost. Mm -hmm. So, again, to, to pose the question, is that something there should be contingency plans for? Because people go on holiday, people go off sick. If you're working on a, a skeleton uh, staff and the bare minimum, Clearly, there's going to be a problem. And my understanding is the Scottish Prison Service does have a contingency for that, and they are using it. So and are you satisfied with that? Is it sufficient? Would you suggest any improvements to it? Um, no. <laughs> I have talked extensively with Colin McConnell, who I think is giving evidence in the next session that might be able to answer your question better, mm -hmm. um, about staff absences and about the population pressures and how those twin problems are actually having an impact on the prison service. I'm fully aware that they have contingencies. Those contingencies are used. We saw those in action. So people being called in on overtime. Mm -hmm. I think it's called something else, but it's his overtime at the end of the day. People extending their shift. So it certainly was happening. Okay. Uh, and before I go on to my substantive question, I think um, going back to someone arrives, there isn't an assessment until, this is Dr Smith, 
to late days, is, would that be right? That's certainly faster than the community, but eight days still seems a very long when time. They, when young people arrive into Polmont, they are seen by the uh, reception staff, and then they're also seen privately by a mental health nurse. So there is, if you like, a screening appointment then, and if needed, then things will be taken forward, such as placed on talk to me or uh, substance withdrawal, those sorts of things. If then there is a further referral to mental health services, then it's eight days. So every young person who comes into Poolmont gets a screening appointment with a registered mental health nurse, which is excellent practice. And it's not the, true of every prison, by the way. Uh -huh, I see. Uh, and would the, the action then be to refer to the assessment once the screening is there? That would be the action from the screening? It, it could be that the young person's placed on talk to me. It could be that they're given withdrawals for drug substance misuse. Mm -hmm. And it could be that they're referred to f for follow-up or an ass further assessment by the mental health team. Yeah. I ask because we know the first 48 hours is, is a critical time. Um, I think in, um, there's been a, a comment that there are too many reviews um, about um, some of the, the, the services and, and particularly looking, I think, at um, maybe the type of review, the, the Council of Europe data seem to present quite a, an upbeat pic picture. However, I uh, understand in your request, um, Chief Inspector, then you you looked at the Scottish Centre for Criminal and Justice Research and this positive finding was challenged and particularly issues were looked at um, around comparative analysis of prison suicide, differing definitions of suicide, the varying quantity of da d uh, data for suicide, all of which meant that um, the rosy picture perhaps wasn't just as good as um, it seemed from the Council of, of Europe data. Could you comment on that? I can, actually, yes. So one of the things I discovered was that the collection of data, so the Scottish, the University of Glasgow Evidence Review, looked at one element of data, even within their own review, they said that actually matching up how they collect the data and how they analyse it is very, very complex. The conclusion we came to was that the Council of Europe collects data in a different way to the University of Glasgow. So one of the things I looked at was how they came to their statistics of 125 per 100,000 or whatever it was. And it looked to me like they were looking at the number of people who were in prison. The Council of Europe data looks at the number of people who go through the prison system. I'm no statistician, I gave up. And that's why my recommendation is, given the very small numbers of suicide, the statistics can be misleading. And therefore it's really important that you know, we have an analytic team that looks at the veracity of it and how we compare to other jurisdictions. It's easy to say we do worse than, uh, than England or whatever, but the numbers they have are far, far larger and I mean, somebody quoted to me the other day, I don't know how true it is, Iceland had one suicide last year, but they're the highest because the number of people they have in prison is very small and the number of suicides they have is very small and one person equates to a very high number. So it is really important that we actually unpick this because I can find no evidence to support either argument. I think the numbers are too small to extrapolate. If we look at the numbers over 15 years, they, they, they go up and down like a, a sine wave. You know, there doesn't seem to be a pattern of a rising trend. There doesn't seem to be a real concern when you look over 15 years. But that certainly, some statistics would argue that there are, and certainly the University of Glasgow argued they are. Other statistics say they aren't. And that's why precisely I've got the review team recognised that some of the conclusions on suicide rates reached in the evidence review may be challenged. I'd be one of those people challenging them. The review team is aware of the difficulties in interpreting potentially conflicting statistical data, including comparative suicide rates. It is conflicting. We therefore recommend that the Scottish Government undertakes further work to better understand Scotland's position relative to other jurisdictions and also to look at the trends. Yeah. 
totally taken on board your, your point about extrapolation, but clearly there's a challenge here, and I think that's something the, the committee would be very interested in, because we understand having meaningful data in the right context is so important so trying important. to address the, yeah. the issue. Um, Liam McArthur, supplementary. Thanks very much. Just taking us into a slightly different area, um, when you mentioned in your opening remarks um, some of the work you'd done looking at the overlap between FAI processes and, and, and the Diplar processes, um, I'd be interested in finding out a little bit more about that. And we've heard, obviously, concerns around the delays in um, taking forward FAIs and, and, and the concerns that that uh, give rise to in terms of learning lessons as well as giving uh, answers to um, family and, and, and friends who clearly have uh, questions out, outstanding. But I, I also know that the, the parents of Katie Allen have expressed some anxiety and concern about even where FAIs take place, the recommendations then not being uh, followed through. So I, I wonder whether that's kind of informed or shaped the, the, the analysis that you were doing of that interaction? Um, two things. One is we absolutely ran out of time and were unable to look at the FAI determinations. I think that is a piece of work that I would love to do or have done, I would love to read, uh, to see whether those determinations and recommendations match up to the Diplar review that happens. Um, and whether or not they're followed through and acted upon. I, I, we didn't have the time in the review to look at that. Right. But, uh, the, the fact that you wanted to do that, is, is that because concerns have been raised with you, similar to the ones, as I say, that Kitty Allen's parents have, have certainly publicly raised about um, FEIs not necessarily, or the, all the recommendations of FEIs not necessarily being followed through? That wasn't raised with us. What right. was raised with us was the time frame the length of time between the, the death and then the subsequent FAI. And I know that I spoke to the Scottish Fatalities Investigation Unit. They also have that concern and they're trying to set a target of 12 months so that any death in custody is actually heard within the 12 months in order to overcome those difficulties. Right. Okay, that's all. And John. Good morning, panel. Um, Chief Inspector, since we have you here, um, can you maybe outline any potential challenges you see in the coming months ahead, more generally with the prison service, please? Good grief. That's a bit of a side blow. Yes, I certainly can. <laughs> I think the population rise, the unprecedented population rise at the moment, is a huge pressure. And, and you know, I'm a very simple soul. Either we've basically got approximately 700 extra people in prison at any given time. That's the equivalent of a large size prison. That's no joke to actually place that pressure on. And then we haven't, I know the Scottish Prison Service has no additional budget to manage those extra 700 people, which is a problem. I don't think we necessarily have the space. We're having, or they are having to put two people into a room primarily designed for one. I think the human rights people are going to be exercised about that. I understand that the um, unions are considering uh, actions or actions short of a strike. I think that's a pressure. So I think the Scottish Prison Service is facing a population pressure, a budget pressure, uh, staffing pressure with the sickness, absence and the unions. I think these are significant pressures. Thank you very much. Can I pick up two of these? And that's not just the growing prison population, but the ageing prison population too. Yes. Does that bring challenges? It certainly is. So one of the things that has become clear for me is that it's not just the rise in prison population, but it's the complexity of the population. So you've got, I think, the difference between 400 and 1400 legacy sex offenders in at the moment. That's a significant difference because they're legacy sex offenders, they are of necessity older and therefore more likely to require social care. Now we've just inspected Glenocal Prison. I was impressed with some of the social care facilities, the reconstruction of the prison there uh, to cope with that issue. But nonetheless, prisons are pre predominantly built for youngish, fittish men, you know? And we're asking very much older people, a much larger older population, to kind of be shoehorned into that. The, the third part of that is we have an increasing level of complaints about progression. 
people feeling that they can't progress through the system and out. Now, I think that's a combination of pressure from increasing numbers. If you've got 700 extra people all competing for offending behaviour programmes, inevitably there's going to be some slowdown in the system. So I think we, as a nation, are going to suffer challenge on um, overcrowding, and I think we're going to suffer challenge on progression. If I may, I'll just do one final, because I know my colleague, um, uh, Liam Kerr, wanted to come in with an issue. The, the ageing staff and the, yes. the, the, the profile regarding retirals and yes. the impact that has, is that something that you've yes. considered? Absolutely. <laughs> so what I've noticed is that there's a bulge, uh, a baby bulge, if you like, which means in about 18 months, a significant number of staff are going to leave because they're due to retire combination of things. One is when they retire, that's a bulge that has to be predicted in succession planning and I've talked to Scottish Prison Service about that and I know they're fully aware and dealing with that. But there's a second half, the bit that does worry me, is that level of corporate knowledge and experience. You know, these are well experienced staff that we're going to be losing a bulk of them at the same time and that does worry me. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Supplementary thought and then Liam Kerr. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Convener. Um, given, given what you've just said there, um, do you feel that the presumption against short-term sentences would be beneficial and helpful uh, if it goes through in terms of, of some of the concerns that you, you raised? I, th I think it's extremely helpful in terms of dealing with recidivism. The evidence is that short-term sentences don't have the same powerful effect on recidivism as community orders, so I really welcome that presumption. And, for me, it's another example of Scotland being leading edge. Um, however, when I looked at the statistics, and please bear in mind, I'm not a statistician, so I'm always relying on other people. Uh, it seems to be that it's going to affect the churn or the turnover in prison, but not have a huge effect or not the effect I'd like to see in reducing the prison population. So if you compound that with the legacy sex offenders the long-term sentences, the longer term for life sentences that people are getting, and the impact of the HDC, what you've got is an increased population that actually PAS is not going to significantly reduce. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to give you the opportunity to elaborate on something that this committee has been very concerned about, uh, which is remand, uh, and indeed you raise concerns about this area yourself in the report. Uh, can you tell us how long, on average, which I accept is not a, a great benchmark, but how long on average are young people spending on remand in this system? I would love to be able to tell you that, but I'd be lying because I can't remember. My apologies. It's something I should know at the top of my head, no, but I can't. So uh, do you have any indication, do you have any sense of, I mean, is this a long time that we're talking about, a, a no. matter of weeks, or uh, is it that people are coming in on remand for a few days and then off they go? It's absolute variation. So you've got some young people coming in for a long time because of the heinousness of their offence. You've got some people coming in for a few days, as you say, and you've got some people coming in for a significant number of weeks. So... I, I, because I don't know the average, I really can't answer that. Do you know if anyone is capturing data on the reasons why remand is being used uh, in the, the cases that you've just mentioned, and indeed whether the use of remand is still appropriate? When I looked at the Inspector of Prosecutions report, one of the recommendations was that um, greater use should be used of early and effective interventions. Um, and they collect the data and have a look at the reasons for remand. We did not. Okay. Yeah. And, and perhaps on, on a similar note, are you aware, it, it, this, this committee put out a report onto remand, as you will be aware, uh, roughly this time last year, I think it was June last year. Are you aware when you've been putting your report together, of whether the Justice Committee's report has led to any concrete action that has fed into your conclusions? I'm not aware. There, were, there are numerous reports. I look at the Health and Sport Committee. 
I've looked at so many reports, my head spins. Mm -hmm. and, and in reality, following up the recommendations was one of the items I mentioned earlier that was extremely hard to do, to actually find a centralised body where I could go and say, these 17 reviews and reports have come up with these 4,000 recommendations. How many of them have been followed through? So I would deeply appreciate that level of knowledge management being available. Thank you. Uh, final question on this. You, you conclude, uh, or one of your conclusions, that we should maximise support for those held on remand, uh, which I think the committee would have sympathy for. Uh, what does that look like? What does maximising support for those on remand look like? OK. I think there's a very simple rule, which is follow the numbers. So when a young person is on remand and they access activities, those numbers are not collected. So if you are convicted or sentenced and you attend activities or you go to appointments, etc., 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 that data is very readily available. The data on remands, how many times they come out of their room, how many visits they've had, what activities they've attended, that data is not readily available. So my first thing is to do that needs analysis and actually say, let's collect that data and have a look. So, for instance, if you find that you've got a young person who isn't coming out of their room, and particularly, or isn't attending activities, then that is a piece of data that can be looked at. You can then send the youth team in to work with them to say, let's get you out. Let's get you out. You'll feel better when you come out. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. There could also be brief mental health interventions that would be available for young people on remand, such as distress brief intervention or brief work with substances. Um, you know, there, there could be mental health interventions that were offered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So just following on from, from Leon Carr's uh, questions, the use of remand in Scotland is, is roughly twice the rate that it is in England and Wales, either by incarceration rate or in terms of prison population, about 10% of the prison population in England and Wales, about 20% in Scotland. One thing that we can't really get to the bottom of, and I think lies behind some of Liam's questions, is, is really why that's the case. I mean, given that you're coming to this with relatively fresh eyes, and I, I don't necessarily expect this to be based on statistics, but I mean, do you have a sense of why we're in that situation in Scotland? I'm not sure I want my comments to be publicly recorded. <laughs> so I don't have the facts behind that, and without facts I'm unwilling to comment. That's an intriguing answer, and I look forward to following up in the future. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Uh, can I just ask finally, um, are remand prisoners in a different section in Pullman from the, the longer term or is there an issue given the, the pressures on space and the, the cell sharing of a, a mix that isn't ideal? No, they're kept separately in Pullman, very comfortably mm -hmm. so. And there is the, sharing of, um, the sharing of cells, is that an issue? It's, it's a really interesting one, actually, because when we talk to young people, some of them feel the benefit of sharing a cell, particularly if it's someone else they know from the outside. It's most of them preferred to be single cell. Um, so, and most of them are in Parliament, so it works quite well. Yeah. That really concludes all our questions. Is there anything that you would like to see in closing? I don't think there's anything I'd like to say other than I really would like the committee to urge the concept of a mental health strategy which goes across Scotland. And just to mention that a lot of the problems that Parliament faces in terms of mental health provision, and, and I mean, I've been quite rigorous in my responses when you read that they're, they're not polite at times, you know, they're very strong. But a lot of the problems that Parliament faces are those of recruitment. You know, they're national problems. Scotland has a problem recruiting mental health staff. Scotland has a problem having a kind of combined mental health assessment approach, which is really, really difficult. The national for lack of a national formulary, the lack of electronic prescribing, those are national problems and not just solely for Pullman. And the recruitment issue, is that a lack of people available or a lack of people um, prepared to go into the prison service? I think it's probably both. Both, yeah.
And perhaps would some work with um, colleges and universities help more of an awareness campaign mm -hmm. that there is definitely a gap in, in, if you like, the market there? I yeah. think the other side is to check whether we actually have sufficient spaces so sufficient people get trained who want to, to, to go into the, into the profession. Yeah. Can I thank you both very much? That's been a very worthwhile evidence session. Uh, we're now going to spend briefly to allow for a change of witnesses.
Agenda item two is the second panel of witnesses on our new inquiry. I refer members to papers one to three. And I remind, uh, if I could just remind members that we have a very large panel today, so I'd be very grateful for succinct questions. And equally to, to the panel, then, if don't feel obliged if you, if you haven't, um, don't need to respond to a question or have nothing to add, please, please just say so. And with that, we'll move straight to questions, starting with Jenny Gorith. Thank you, Convener. And good morning to the panel. Um, I'd just like to start with a, an opening question with regard to the mental health needs of children and young people. Um, we heard from the previous panel, as you, you may have heard, about the impact of social isolation on, on mental health. Um, we also heard a little bit about the impact of adverse childhood experiences. And I wonder if the panel might be able to share some of their thoughts around those areas. Um, yes, um, we can. Um, we've undertaken, as some of the other centres have as well, we've undertaken particular pieces of research around ACEs, given that we very strongly believe and see uh, young people who are overrepresented with ACEs. And the current framework actually accounts for about 10 adverse experiences. We've, in our research, had to add to that. So we've actually, actually done research on, on 13 ACEs. And some young people have been admitted to secure care centres. Um, Rossi and others will, will actually exceed um, certainly exceed 10. So the, the import of that is that um, young people can have adverse experiences and traumatic experiences and not actually have any mental health issues. I think that's important to say as well. Yeah. But what we do know about ACE is that they are likely to influence fundamental biological processes. Um, so the timing of these adverse events is important. Um, and what they engrave is, is kind of what they call long-lasting epigenetic marks, which are non-genetic influences. So it's like whatever your hereditary load is, plus on top, that will be the, the ACEs. Um, and these impact, as we know, on, on kind of neurological systems. So they, they do impact on behaviour, they'll impact on, on how our young people learn. I think we spend a great deal of time in secure care and we've learnt to, when we're accommodating young people and when we're receiving young people, that actually a lot of the time what we're doing is, is calming down what we'd call toxic shock, you know, because these young people are so alert, you know, they're hyper vigilant at times because of the traumatic experience that they've encountered. Um, uh, and they're also, um, you know, significantly adver ad adversely affected by, by ACEs. So th th that, I think that has implications for any system mm -hmm. admitting young people. If you have awareness of that, then you need to adapt your systems accordingly. So what we've been spending a lot of time doing in the, in the secure estate, and I know that Alison would contend that we don't have a secure estate, um, but, you know, as it's currently constructed, the secure estate in Scotland, we spend a lot of time actually being trauma-informed so that our policies, our reception, our admission processes are all informed by that, that very fact that these young people are, are very likely to be in survival modes of fight, flight, yeah. freeze, and, and we need our systems to be able to, to cope with that and to provide predictability, safety, consistency, and you know, begin, begin then to... To, to use the relational care that we all offer to actually make progress with the young people. Mm -hmm. Sorry, long answer to what was a short question. Because I've been very remiss in not introducing the panel. I think that would be helpful if I did that at the very beginning. So, uh, in order, Alison uh, Goff, Director of the Good Shepherd Centre, Audrey Baird, Executive Director of Education Learning and Development with Kibble Education Care Centre, David Mitchell, Head of Operations, Rossi Young People's Trust, Carol Deary, Head of Services, St Mary's Kenmuir, and Colin McCall, uh, McConnell, Chief Executive and Leslie McDowell, Health and Strategy and Suicide Prevention Manager with the Scottish Prison Service. Alison, you were going to say. <laughs> I was just going to um, continue where, where David kind of completed his uh, um, opening comments. 
Um, I think what David's been explaining was backed up by a very recent survey that was undertaken by the Centre for Youth and Criminal Justice, and that was a census of all children and young people who were in secure care at a certain point in 2018, and that really did confirm, um, alongside lots of other studies that have been done in Scotland, uh, including the work of the Secure Care National Project, which was an independent review of secure care, which explored the, the lives and backgrounds of children in secure care in Scotland. Um, that firstly, children from our least privileged Scottish communities are hugely overrepresented amongst the, the, the population of, of children and young people who come into secure care, and that the majority of children arrive with significant psychological distress, numerous adverse uh, experiences in their background, um, and often extreme abuse, neglect, trauma, and exposure to significant levels of violence um, in their early years. So during the course of that census, half of the children arriving at Good Shepherd Centre, for example, at that point, had expressed thoughts about ending their lives, and a third of young people had actually attempted to end their lives in the year prior to, to coming into secure care. A high proportion of young people had been diagnosed with a mental illness, either previously or were at that point receiving treatment, and the exposure to interpersonal violence and involvement in interpersonal violence was a significant feature. And that same CGI sentence, uh, census also confirms several other recent studies that have been done UK-wide, uh, including the work of Heidi Hales down in England, which was an exploration of all children in secured settings, whether YOIs, uh, secure hospitals, or secure uh, children's homes down in England. So I think we do know that these are some of the most uh, um, extremely vulnerable uh, challenged young people um, with, with very, very difficult backgrounds. So they will all have mental health and well-being needs, if not necessarily a mental illness. Anyone? Yes, come. I think just to go back to the question about the mental health, and you mentioned again social isolation, I think that it's really different for secure care, um, that we don't um, have young people on demand who don't do anything other than a full participation of all, of, all, all activities and education, etc. And when it comes to any social isolation, then there is a legal requirement based placed on us that we have to fill in documentation if a young person goes to the room. Um, or we've, if we place the young person in the room, we have to give a reason why that's done, and there's a very strict criteria. So social isolation is really um, something that is not used a lot in secure care. Um, because of, and it's not to suggest that POM isn't therapeutic, but our emphasis on, as David says, a trauma-informed approach. And trauma-informed approach is about relationships. It's about understanding the, the context of that child's life, and the understanding and the causation of some of that behaviour. When it comes to the mental health provision, um, we work very closely with FCAMs and CAMs. Um, we also have a, a clinical psychologist who, who carries out an initial mental health screening, um, and that formulates part of the care plan. So it's slightly different for us um, in terms of what we access uh, to, to, to the, the prison service. Carol, I was quite struck by your submission because you say um, a protocol on transferring from secure to employment would be useful as this would hopefully lead to a consistent approach for young people when transferring to the, the prison environment. And we heard in the previous evidence session about an inconsistency in terms of how information is shared. I wonder if the SPS want to perhaps respond to that point. Yeah, I'll make, I'll make a, a general comment and then more specifically, Leslie, can, uh, if the panel, if the committee wishes, can pick up on on the detail. Um, I think we are on an improvement journey, but it would be crazy of me to suggest that we've got everything uh, nailed down. In fact, the improvements have been led by, uh, by the Scottish Government in terms of the dialogue between secure care and the Scottish Prison Service for those planned uh, movements from secure care uh, into, into our care. Um, Sometimes things happen that aren't planned or come at short notice, and I think we're more vulnerable in these uh, situations than I think what is becoming a better understood and be better mapped out uh, set of arrangements for those uh, movements that are planned. So my concern would be in this discussion um, about where the vulnerabilities are for those movements that aren't planned or for some reason come, come around at short notice. Um, so throughout... 2019, we've been developing a um, safe operating procedure for planned and unplanned transfer from secure accommodation. Um, 
if it's if it's a planned uh, transfer, the um, Children and Families Directorate within Scottish Government would notify um, HMP YOI Pullman that there was going to be a transfer. Um, and at that point, uh, we would look to have an initial meeting about six months prior to that transfer. Um, so um, SPS would meet with the secure accommodation um, and would be able to uh, share information on that young person. And then about a month prior to tra the transition, again, um, SPS would meet with the secure accommodation, but also our key partners, including NHS, social work, would also be part of that discussion, so that prior to the individual coming into our care, uh, we would have all the information available. Uh, where it's unplanned, that is more difficult. However, um, it's more about an escalation. So when we uh, are made aware that a young person is coming, um, we're, we're asking that um, just the very fact that that person might be attending court, that we're alerted to that. So there's the potential that that young person might come into our custody um, and that our governor and deputy governor would be made aware of it um, immediately. Um, and that as at the earliest possible opportunity, uh, a multidisciplinary case conference um, would be um, convened along with somebody from Secure Care um, so that we could get all the information available at the earliest opportunity. Thank you for that. Um, I notice in David Mitchell's submission, he talks about the, the need for custodial set settings to benefit from a trauma-informed care lens to admissions during custody and transitions. Is that something you're considering at the moment? Yeah, so as um, part of our uh, training development, we are looking at um, trauma-informed uh, practices uh, for staff within Pullman. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're looking to develop training um, and we're currently working with NHS Health Scotland. Would that be part of the admissions? Because so, I noticed you said there that's within Pullman, but as part of the admissions process, is that going to be considered? So we would do that in partnership with NHS because um, although we, we um, assess an individual when they come into Pullman, so do NHS um, as part of their um, initial uh, mental health <laughs> assessment when somebody comes in. Do education carry out an assessment as well then? Not, not when the, first, the person first comes in, but if an individual was wanting to access education, then they would uh, carry out an assessment. But they have to opt in. If, I noticed you said there, if they wanted to, they, they, they have to opt into it. It's not mandatory, is that it right? It is for, for, for certain age groups, um, right. but if they were over 18, then it wouldn't be mandatory to, okay. to access education. Yeah, thank you. John, I know transition was an area that you want. Do you have anything else to...? Just a very small point yep. on that. Uh, um, thank you, convener. And, and to ask uh, Ms McDowell, you, you, you mentioned in relation to the multidisciplinary team, so we've heard potentially education may be involved, mm -hmm. social work involved, health involved. Is there anyone else involved at all? Uh, I mean, these would be our key partners, but there, there's, it's, not, uh, it's uh, not an exhaustive list, so there could be anybody that we felt it was appropriate to be part of that individual's care could be part of that case conference. So who might that be, please? I understand it could be some of the other care providers. So maybe families as well, if, mm. that, if that was appropriate. OK, thank you very much. Okay. Liam McCarthy, you've got a supplementary. Just uh, uh, for definitional purposes, you talked about planned and unplanned uh, transitions from the secure care uh, sector to the uh, prison sector. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that nothing is wholly unplanned as any transition is going to have a degree of, of, of planning attached to it. Can you maybe um, describe what an unplanned transition uh, looks like? I think a planned one is probably fairly self-evident. Um, for for um, our definition of unplanned is where um, a young person who's currently in secure care um, may be attending court. Um, so our, our planned ones are where a person reaches an age that they would no longer be held in secure care. Um, so we know that they would be coming to us. Uh, but it may be that somebody who's attending court, the, the sheriff may determine that the person goes back to secure accommodation or they may determine that that person should be held in custody in Pullman. Around time on, in, in that case can be, can be very, very short. Very short. Right, okay. Rona. Thanks, Convener. Uh, good morning. Um, before I ask my question, I just want to say that I've visited um, three of the units here today, and I'm um, barring the Good Shepherd, I think. Um, I'm hugely impressed with the work that you do and the, the caring work you do and the ethos in each of the units. I just want to put that on record. Um, can I ask you whether you think the upper age limit um, for young people being in secure units should be extended, should be raised, and could there be some sort of hybrid model between um, the SPS and yourselves to enable that young person to stay in the, the secure unit r rather than go to prison? involved in some discussions with, with Wendy about the need to look at some sort of hybrid model, as you say. 
One of the concerns that I have, and I'm sure it's shared with my colleagues, is there's more emphasis put on age than there is on vulnerability, in my opinion. Um, and what happens is that when a young person magically reaches the age of 18, I had a young man recently who's doing exceptionally well. Um, we serve in his sentence in St Mary's, and he was moved to Pullman with only a few months to serve. Um, and I'm really uncomfortable with that. Um, and I think that years ago, when I first started on this journey, if you had a young person who only had a short term and sentence after the age of 18, they resided in the secure unit. And that somehow changed. I'm not entirely sure if any of my colleagues are able to shed any light on why it did. I don't know if it was demands for places at that particular time. But we suddenly saw our, our children, our young people, being moved away from relationships which they had often formed for a period of years, particularly if they were sentenced kids. And they were suddenly being taken away and put in a prison environment, which is very different in terms of its structure. And um, I don't know the answer to that, except to say that I sincerely hope that there is serious consideration by this committee to look at why we put so much emphasis on age, the vulnerability, the ACEs, mental health, all these things should urge us to say age is really much lower down what we should be looking at and vulnerability. You'll see in my response, I did say that I think there's a need to look at a hybrid. I'm sure the question about secure places going to cross borders is going to come up, um, and we'll answer that in due course. But the reality is, whilst Pullman's numbers were going up for 16 to 18, we were sitting with secure places that take up to 18. Um, so I've got my own view, and happy to share that when that question comes up as to what that may be about. Um, but for me, certainly, I think there is an urgency to look at the age limit in secure care. And even if it needs to go further than 18, it needs to go further than 18. If we can prevent our young people being in a prison environment and being in a secure environment, which is enshrined with children's legislation, why wouldn't we want that for, for our kids? Thank you. Anyone else like to comment? Kibble's um, experience and research to date um, suggests that there is definitely a need in the, new, in the UK um, uh, to provide an alternative provision for uh, children with mental health needs that are currently being placed in uh, the Scottish Prison Service. Um, it's quite clear that regardless of their mental health difficulties, children are being placed within a prison <coughs> environment that is not suitable to meet their needs. We also have children with acute mental health needs that are currently being placed in secure locked placements that isn't meeting their needs either. And what is needed is not necessarily just a hybrid model between um, the secure services and the Scot Scottish prison services, but a hybrid model that looks at the therapeutic needs of young people that leads a trauma-informed approach. And at the moment, Kibble is in the process of developing such a service that takes a much more of a holistic approach to meeting these young people's needs um, that isn't within a locked environment. So it's about intensive support using services in care, education, clinical um, input that may be required, interventions that are required for these people for these young people and children that isn't within a locked environment. And at the moment, we are looking at that. We are, we are dealing with uh, young people who have very complex mental health needs, young people who are receiving medication and require constant um, care, young people who present high risks to themselves and to others, young people who are um, receiving um, medical intervention, sometimes requiring hospitalisation, young people who demonstrate high-risk behaviours uh, that require a multi-agency agency response, and young people who have been mainly rejected by systems and who have a history of multi-placement breakdowns. And it's really, really important that we're not placing some of these young people in locked environments, whether that be within prison or within a secure unit. Th some of these young people need a therapeutic trauma led approach to meeting their mental health needs and at the moment Scotland probably nationally internationally that type of facility doesn't exist 
and it's something that we really have to develop and it's something that Kibble is looking at at the moment, is looking to develop. We've done research, we've been, because there isn't any of these um, facilities that currently exist in Scotland for children, we have been going to facilities such as the Prince and Princess of Wales Hospice at Bella Houston Park in Glasgow. We've been going around to look at Maggie centres, um, where they don't deal necessarily with children, but they create therapeutic, trauma-informed-led approaches to dealing with real, specific clinical issues that um, need a holistic approach in terms of education, care, psychiatry, psychology, all of these different areas, and but not necessarily within a locked environment, because a locked environment can actually re-traumatise some of these young people that, who do suffer from these mental health difficulties. And we're looking at things like drug and alcohol misuse, we're looking at anger and ir irritability, depression, anxiety, sleep disorders, we're looking at suicidal and, and um, ideation, thought disturbance, traumatic experiences that the young people have, have um, um, experienced throughout their lives. And so therefore we need to look further than just looking at a hybrid model that is specific to locking a young person up. But we need to look at models that are not about lo locking young people up, but that are actually meeting their needs within an open environment and provide that intensive support that they really need. Thank you. Supplementary Daniel, then Liam Kerr. Uh, I, mean, I just really wanted to uh, follow up on, on, on some things that, that, that Wendy Sinclair said, and I think in particular, I think that the point that she raised about the, the lack of consistency between health boards and, and that lack of strategic integration between the services that health boards provide and then the, 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 the services which are available uh, within your context. I was just wondering if, if, if that's something that you recognised, uh, and if so, what in your view can be done within the secure care sector to, to improve that, that integration? Um, I think I'll take the opportunity to. Um, I think, as, as Dr. Smith mentioned, um, the Glasgow Secure Care Centres have um, access to a jointly co-designed secure care pathway, um, which which you know meets the needs of, of young people within the three Glasgow Secure Care Centres or, or Secure Care Centres within that, that kind of geographical area. Um, we don't have that in Tayside, and for those of you who read a bit about my background, I was a, a psychiatric nurse in Fife before I moved to social work, and then, you know, um, through various twists, um, found myself head of operations at Rossi Young People's Trust. Coming to Rossi Young People's Trust 12 years ago, um, and having been a mental health officer in Dundee, um, which is a, a social worker with particular training in mental health, it was one of the areas that I thought that would impact on significantly. And what's, what's happened over the, the past is that um, we, we used to have a project called the Rossi Elms Project, and Dundee used to also have some secure care beds. So this was a, a shared facility which, which gave us what we need and what we still need, actually, um, which is um, consultant adolescent psychiatrist, interested in our client group and undertaking in-reach work, reviewing cases, along with two project officers who happened to be, at the time, one was a social worker and one was a nurse, and they were primary, primary care workers, primary mental health care workers who operated within Rossi and the unit in Dundee. And when intensive, they were, they were funded via intensive support monies, and when those monies came to an end in 2008, and this was a service that evaluated very well, um, when the service came to an end in 2008, um, the consultant psychiatrist and the two primary mental health care workers were subsumed back into NHS Tayside. Um, since then, despite what I think colleagues have said here about the levels of adversity, the levels of trauma, the levels of uh, need prevalence relating to, to mental health that, that we have in secure care, We've only been able to access that service by a referral process, which is either done by members of our specialist intervention service, which includes a, a forensic psychologist or a general trained nurse, and we also have some specialist intervention workers, or by our GP. 
And what, what that does in effect, and you know, I, I, I want to be balanced in my account to committee today because um, you know, I've, I've read Mr David Strang's interim report on mental health services in the NHS Tayside and, and he makes a brief mention of CAMS within that. The balance bit is that I would say that where it, where it works, and there are examples of where it works, it works very well. Um, and you know that we where it works well, we are getting that in reach. We are able to, uh, you know, it operates as a multidisciplinary team around the child. Where it doesn't work is, is clearly where we're referring in, and um, we have very mixed response times to, you know, the needs of our young people. So, for example, um, and I, I just picked three cases before I came away yesterday. Young person referred on the 22nd of August, a follow-up consultation by telephone in September, a telephone consultation on the 18th of December, um, to advise us that they were still on the waiting list. Um, so th they remained actually on the waiting list until their discharge date in April 2019. So unfortunately, what I have to report today is that within a, a, a near eight-month time frame, that young person who had extensive mental health needs wasn't seen, despite us referring into the service in which we believed we would get uh, a service. We have another young person current who was referred for a medication review. She was actually admitted with a number of um, existing psychiatric drugs which need reviewed, and sometimes drugs like um, that are provided in relation to ADHD. There's a requirement for regular blood pressure checking, or drugs like aripiprazole, or some of the mood stabilizers like lithium. These all require regular uh, bloods taken to check toxicity levels and, and kind of therapeutic values. Um, so a young person referred for a meds review in January 2019. We, we actually have we've, we've not received the service, uh, and neither did we get any confirmation that the referral was received. So there are very clearly geographical disparities, you know, and certainly where we are in Angus, we, we look with jealous regard to what's being created um, by Dr Smith and the other centres down in Glasgow in relation to the secure care pathway, because it's, it's clearly a better system, um, you know, and, and, and it ensures that there's, a, there's key points of contact for referrals, um, the, the waiting times are, are, are short, there is active inreach by the consultant psychiatrist into the centres alongside CAMS and forensic CAMS staff. And that, in essence, is, is um, one of the key reasons why I was keen to come today, to highlight to you exactly what that disparity looks like for some of our most vulnerable young people who are currently accommodated within Rossi. Thank you for that very substantial answer. I won't ask anything further, but thank you. But can I just make the point that, that it sends a world away from an eight-week wait uh, for services and, and something which, to my ear, sounds wholly intolerable. So I'll, but I'll hand it back. Yeah. Liam Kerr. Very I'd just like to clarify with Leslie McDowell something that you said earlier. Um, I think I heard you say that a, a judge can determine whether somebody goes into custody or stays in secure care. Uh, on that then, if a judge is determining that, is that against any particular criteria? And in any event, are the reasons why a particular decision is arrived at, uh, captured and analysable? Um, I can only speak to my experience mm -hmm. uh, where a young person has come into custody instead of going back to secure. Um, in one instance, it was where a, a young man um, had uh, committed a, an extremely violent act within the secure accommodation, and therefore it was felt it, he was best placed within Pullman. Um, and on the second occasion, the, his social work actually um, requested that he went back to secure accommodation. However, there wasn't a place available um, and therefore the sheriff made the decision that he would come into custody. I see, but the, 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 the sheriff's decision, is, is, that, uh, is anyone able to draw down that decision and say that's why that decision was come to? I don't know, sorry. All right, thank you. Okay. Shona. Um, we've touched already on some of the issues about the interaction between the, the penal system and secure care um, and I guess trying to pick up on 
what was said in the, the last session, which uh, I think you were present for, um, is around the issue of, of protocols and information sharing. Um, the transition process, I think, was described as um, being variable in terms of what information comes with the young person um, between agencies and at different stages, including um, between the, the penal system and secure care. So I guess what I would want to hear from the panel is um, what, how soon would agencies begin to interact where a, a, young, a vulnerable young person was due to be transferred from secure care to Pullman, uh, what assessments are undertaken, how could that be improved? And one of the suggestions um, in the previous panel around interagency communication was this idea of a consensus agreement. Um, it would be helpful to hear particularly um, from uh, Eliza McDowell and, and Colin McConnell what your view of that is and whether you think that's something that could be helpful in making sure information is uh, is good, accurate, and quick. So um, we have an information sharing protocol between the Scottish Prison Service and the nine health boards um, who have responsibility for uh, the delivery of healthcare in prisons, um, which gives us a framework uh, by which we are able to agree which information can be shared uh, and by which routes it's shared. Um, so that is certainly a very helpful tool for both the prison service and for health boards um, and for practitioners um, on the ground. Um, so having something in place uh, with secure accommodation, with social work that then um, clearly set out um, what information could be shared and with who uh, would certainly be very helpful. What about though beyond? I mean, that, that's um, uh, you know, clearly a, a protocol between the prison service and the health boards, as you've said, but in terms of something that could be at quite an early stage of the young person's um, placement, uh, do you um, think who, who might lead on something like a consensus agreement? Would you see yourselves leading on that to, to make it happen? Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to comment. Um, I think first and foremost, uh, you know, we have to recognise that um, whilst things have undoubtedly improved uh, over recent uh, months, um, I think as the Chief Inspector and Dr Smith have, have indicated, we have a long way to go yet mm -hmm. uh, before any of us could be uh, satisfied with the, either the level of information sharing or, for that matter, the detail of it. Um, in terms of uh, who's responsible, I. I I suppose it may seem a sloping shoulders job, but not intended to be. I think there is a broader policy issue uh, here uh, that, that has to be uh, tackled. I mean, this is multi-agency, multi-specialism, and whether one individual agency uh, could take that on is, is, is a matter of um, some discussion, if not debate. But be clear, um, you know, SPS is right at the end of the pipe on this. We absolutely understand that as we are on, on many other uh, issues associated with um, care or, for that matter, justice. Um, so we would most uh, certainly be um, prepared to uh, act as the, um, um, the generating point, the coalescing uh, point, the driving force, uh, if you like, if indeed um, other organisations and other agencies were comfortable uh, with that. I think it's important to point out, of course, there are commentators who might uh, might view the SBS, you know, taking a, a responsibility for generating uh, a protocol or a series of arrangements like that might might not be in the best interests of all uh, parties, given we are a large nationally uh, funded uh, organisation. But uh, you know, in the absence of uh, any any other <laughs> uh, clear volunteers or, or willing willing parties, or for that matter. Um, you know, determination being made, and certainly the Scottish Prison Service would be prepared to act as that sort of coalescing body. Mm. That's helpful. Liam Kerr. Oh, sorry. I yeah. want to point out that um, certainly the Scottish Government did initiate in 2017 um, some meetings between um, Polmont and the secure care services, provi secure care providers, um, and a meeting did take place in Polmont. Um, which looked at ways in which we can improve transitions for young people, and I believe that those discussions are still ongoing. Okay. Thank you. 
convener, and that's that's exactly the point I was, I was making earlier. You know, it, it would be wrong um, for the committee to be left with the impression um, that no progress has been made. Uh, quite quite the opposite. And I think, again, to be fair to Scottish government colleagues, I mean, they certainly have picked this up, and the situation is much much better now uh, across the landscape than it was. But we absolutely recognise, given the vulnerable group of young people we're dealing with, there is much more that both needs to be done and we would want to see done. Thank you. No one else? Uh, Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. On that point, uh, I'll, I'll stick with uh, Colin McConnell and Leslie McDowell, if I may. Uh, we're looking at the report on Parliament earlier on, uh, and there are a number of recommendations made in that document uh, and required action specifically relating to the SPS. So the question then becomes, what is your view of the report and its conclusions, and do you accept all the action points that are on the SPS? So if, if I make a view, and just to be clear, there were two reports uh, published on Parliament. One was uh, the Chief Inspector's uh, inspection of Parliament per se, uh, and all the aspects that, that go along with the operation of Parliament. And then there's a wider commentary uh, in terms of a report on mental health provision uh, at Parliament, but more generally across the system. So, looking at the report that we were looking at this morning, mm -hmm. uh, it makes a number of recommendations on the SPS. Uh, does the SPS accept the terms of that report and accept all the action points in that report? Uh, and it's the, the, I can see where you're going with that question, but of course the report is not directed to me or the SPS. The report is directed to the Cabinet Secretary uh, for, for Justice, and the Cabinet Secretary has been, been very clear that he welcomes the report and that he'll be commenting to Parliament uh, on, on the views of the report, uh, I think, before recess. Let me perhaps rephrase the question, Mr McConnell, because you'll forgive me, but that sounded like quite an evasive answer, if I may. This report, I'm looking at the key messages uh, right here, and it says, an enhanced approach should be developed by the Scottish Prison Service uh, for the Talk to Me strategy. Just for example, that's one of three. Uh, and all I'm asking is, do you accept those reports, the, the, the recommendations that are specifically directed at the SPS? And if so, will you be actioning them? Um, I'm sorry that you think I'm evasive, um, but I have to be clear to you. I'm going to answer your question more, mm -hmm. more directly, Mr Kerr. Um, but as I say, I'm sorry you think I'm being evasive because I'm absolutely stating a fact. And that is a report is to the Cabinet Secretary, who's already made clear that he will make a statement to Parliament before recess. So that's the government's position on it. As far as the SPS is concerned, we welcome any recommendation that can help us improve our practice towards anybody that passes into our care. But I'll leave it to the Cabinet Secretary to make a broader judgment on each of these recommendations in due course. Thank you. I wonder if I could press you um, a little bit on staff absences, just generally. That was covered this morning. Um, do you have a comment on that? Yes, um, staff absence in, in, in the SPS uh, is uh, troubling. Um, you know, we have near enough 4,500 people in our, our workforce. Um, you know, they suffer the same illnesses and afflictions as anybody else in, in the general population. So, um, you know, staff aren't immune to, to being ill. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the Chief Inspector's commentary about the relationship between you know, population pressures and staff absence, um, un undoubtedly there is a relationship, but I think it would, it would be uh, unfortunate if um, the committee were to be left with the impression that staff absence in the prison service was simply driven by um, population pressures. I think that is an, an impacting factor, but not in itself the determining factor. But because um, staff absence levels are high, uh, that does impact uh, on our general uh, ability to deploy staff in their own system. And I heard uh, quite rightly um, you know, committee members asking the, the Chief Inspector about whether, I think in fact it was yourself, Kavina, uh, whether SPS has, has contingencies uh, for uh, such eventualities. And, and yes, we do. And in fact, our, our, um, the calculations that underpin um, the number of staff that we have available in any um, prison establishment is informed by um, an assumption that you know, staff will take annual leave, staff will, will be off sick, staff will have to go on training. Um, I think it's fair to say that the absence levels have gone above 
uh, that, that allowance. Uh, so we are additionally covering those uh, shortfalls with uh, what we call ex gratia payments, uh, which the Chief Inspector referred to as uh, overtime payments. Yeah, I think the Chief Inspector made it clear that prison servers will go that extra mile, but um, I think she also referred to the ageing population of, of prison staff mm -hmm. as well. So is there anything that you would like to see um, that you can factor in that this committee could be looking at for the future to, to help the pressure? Yes, I, I would. Now, I'm really grateful that you've, uh, you've raised that. Um, in, in some ways, I was... Um, uh, left betwixt and between when, when, when the Chief Inspector quite rightly outlined the, the sort of baby boom bulge that, that we undoubtedly have and you know the majority of our staff are sort of 40 and, and plus, now that's young to me but 40 plus uh, to um, other folk. Um, I only wish, I only wish that the Chief Inspector was right in that um, they would be retiring soon and she has every reason to, to expect that that would be the case. But since the UK government, of course, changed the uh, pension rules um, probably about a decade ago now uh, in terms of um, when public servants could, uh, could retire, prison officers were disproportionately affected by that and currently have to work until they're 67 and due course will have to work until they're 68. Now, frankly, the thought of prison officers, and we've discussed here this morning um, some of the real complicated cases uh, in terms of people who pass our way, whether it's from uh, secure care or for, that, or for that matter, direct into our care. And those, again, as the Chief Inspector and, and Dr Smith has referred to as you know, the changing nature of the prison population becoming more, pro more uh, complex, more, more challenging, in itself more aged then the prospect of 67, 68-year-old prison officers day and daily turning out on the landings um, to try and deliver a personalised service, with, of course, let's not uh, get away from it. You know, prisons can, can be violent places, thankfully not all too often, but they can be. Uh, and therefore, 67 and 68-year-old prison officers having to deal with that, uh, I, I, I think is not a prospect that Scotland should, should welcome. So yes, our um, prison officer cadre are getting older, but by golly, they're not going to be able to retire because uh, the UK government has determined that they can't. So the issue is not having actual bodies because they won't be there. It's the issue of their ability to do the job. I think it's, yeah, it's a combination of, of issues. And again, it's just a matter of fact that as we get older, we tend to suffer from more chronic uh, conditions. Uh, and, of course, if, if, if you just, in, in a sense, um, you work with the imagery that I've, um, uh, I've set out for the committee, you know, the prospect of um, older um, prison officers having to engage with, you know, sporadic uh, violence, some of it extremely uh, violent and confrontational, and the prospect of them being able to, in a sense, take that on the chin, recover from it quickly and get back to work is, is something that we, we should be really, really concerned about. Daniel and then uh, Liam MacArthur, supplementary. So I'd just like to ask a, a couple of supplementaries. And I understand your reticence to not give a formal response to the report until the Cabinet Secretary is responded. However, I think there are some broad points, and I think if I could characterise it as this, there's a, a broad point about strategic fit with your agency and, and others, which I think needs to be addressed. There's also one, I think, about maturity in terms of, I think, when you look at things like TTM and the, the approach in terms of induction uh, to, to, to appointment, um, there's good practice, but that's not necessarily bedded in. There's talk about tick boxes and, and then actually what happens thereafter. In terms of that broad characterisation, would you reflect that, that that's correct? And, and are there things that actually you can be doing to, to get going with that before you've heard from the Cabinet Secretary? Um, two, I'll, I'll answer that in, in, in two ways. Uh, I, and part of my, the first part of my answer is, as I said to Mr Kerr, you know, we welcome any um, direction that will take us to improve the services that we deliver to the people who pass in our care. So, um, please, please take that as a given, uh, and, and, and that, is, that is SPS embracing um, the positivity of the report at the end of the day. Anything that can make our services better, we will embrace it and get on with it. Uh, in the meantime, um, you know, a number of things have been happening specifically at Palmont um, to improve 
the general awareness and capability of our staff, mm. uh, as well as the availability of services to those who pass in and out of care. And I say that uh, to you um, in order to address specifically uh, Mr Scales' concerns that I was being defensive. Quite the opposite. Uh, I'm being very clear about what the position is vis-a-vis -vis SPS and the Cabinet Secretary's statement. But secondly, to give this committee an absolute assurance that we are a progressive organisation and will take every step that we can to improve the services that we deliver. So can I ask you about one specific step? I mean, one of the points that slightly surprised me was the, the, the point uh, raised in the report uh, suggesting that staff desired greater training um, in, in terms of specific mental health conditions, uh, uh, ADHD, ASD, uh, borderline uh, personality disorder were, were, were specifically named. And I'm, I'm in a sense surprised that that training doesn't already happen, uh, given the over-representation of some of those conditions within the prison population. And is that something, that specific training for your staff in Pullman, something that perhaps you can pr progress in advance of, of, of any uh, statement? I mean, I'll, I'll let Leslie yeah. comment on that uh, in a minute. But, but generally, um, I mean, your question was really helpful in the sense that what reminds us uh, around the committee is the complex challenge that we face in caring for uh, some extraordinarily vulnerable and uh, traumatised uh, people who, who pass into our care, whether it's um, the secure uh, community or, or indeed uh, the Scottish Prison Service. So I think what you've helpfully uh, done, Mr Johnson, is, is set out actually the scale of the challenge uh, that we face. Now, the first thing I wouldn't want to try and either create or pretend is that prison officers in Scotland can become experts mm. in, in those issues. It, it, we simply don't have the capability, or for that matter, the, the, the um, recruitment approach to, to deliver that. We really do rely um, on our colleagues in, in the NHS, but more broadly uh, in other support services to help us to provide that wide range of services. Do we want to make sure that um, our staff are able to pick up on some of the, the, the signs, the indications that people are, um, have limitations or suffer or have needs? Then, of course. And I, I think what we will want to try and do is make sure that when our, our, our staff are able to be sensitised to that, that yeah. they're able to signpost quickly to the best sources of, of help uh, that we can provide. But, Leslie, you might want to, to comment more specifically. Yeah, so some of the, the conditions you mentioned on an ad hoc basis, some of that training has taken place um, in partnership with NHS. Um, so some um, awareness around um, ADHD has taken place, but it would be to key staff. Um, however, um, we've now um, secured um, mental health first aid training for young people and uh, key staff within Pullman um, will be receiving that training, um, I think now, actually, they're going through that training just now. Um, we've also started working with NHS Health Scotland um, to develop a, a training package for our officers around mental health awareness, and exactly as Colin said, more about identifying the signs um, that somebody might be struggling or have a, a mental illness, and then signposting them. Um, and the other thing is, I mean, the... the National Mental Health Strategy um, for 2017 to 2027, uh, Scottish Government gave a commitment to review uh, mental health training for frontline staff, as did the Suicide Prevention Action Plan. And again, we are working with NHS Health Scotland. We participated in, um, in giving comment on some of that training, um, and we have also said that we would be happy to pilot um, any training that came out from those two strategies. Can I just clarify, when you're talking about mental health, are you including neurodevelopmental disorders and learning difficulties within that, or is that are you is the mental health restricted to kind of anxiety, depression, uh, and, and, and and those sorts of issues? Yes, yeah, so so yes, it is. But actually, um, there's another piece of work that has gone through the National Prisoner Health Network Advisory Board, um, and uh, there has there's been research done on learning disability uh, within prisons as well as um, head injury, and um, the draft report certainly gives a recommendation that. Um, uh, prison officers are given training in uh, learning disability and head injury, so we're awaiting the final report on that before we yeah. would uh, action can, it. Can I just make a, a, a final comment? I mean, when you're looking at 50% of the prison population as a low estimate, which is what just heard, having some sort of learning difficulty, I totally accept that your staff are not going to become 
you know, mental health nurses or, 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 or uh, you know, professionals in that sense, but they have to have insight and information and expertise, but because such a high proportion of the people you're working with have those conditions, it, I would just simply put it that it's, it's a necessity for them to do their job. If I could comment, I 100% I agree, and I would, I would go further um, that your point is well made uh, in that, of course, whilst we're focused here on um, you know, particularly vulnerable uh, and, and needy young people, you, you could broaden out that concern across the whole estate. Yes. Uh, and so this isn't, this isn't just a, a concern and a no. need about Pullman, which I entirely uh, accept, your, your, your point, but people move on. Uh, and people take those those needs and vulnerabilities with them. Thank you. Ian MacArthur, supplementary. Yeah, a couple of supplementaries. Mm. Um, in relation to the point that was being made in relation to uh, staffing levels, um, Mr McConnell, you were um, having a, a probably quite legitimate um, uh, got the UK government around uh, pensions reform. I'd be interested to know what the figures are of those aged 65, 66, 67 who are operating on the wings and are potentially at risk of um, uh, encountering violent situations and how that differs from the situation prior to, to, to pensions reform. And presumably you manage your staffing um, in accordance with risk and in, in accordance with um, the, the, the skills and abilities, etc., of, of the staff. So uh, I don't have the figures, but I can, I can actually... Uh, if, if, if you want, I can write to you and give you that, that, that breakdown, if that would be helpful. We have, at this moment in time, a relatively small in proportion uh, terms, numbers of staff ap approaching the 67 or 65, 66. But that number will grow. And that, that was my, my point about the Chief Inspector's observation, which is absolutely spot on, is that the age profile of the staff, because of that recruitment bulge previously, is moving to the right. So that will become more of an issue uh, for us. Um, in terms of you know, responding to um, staff capability uh, and, and capacity, there is a requirement for prison officers to perform the full uh, duties. I mean, we have only limited opportunities uh, or facilities to deploy fully trained, fully remunerated prison officers into non-frontline uh, roles. So we absolutely require um, the maximum capacity of our prison officer cadre to be deployable on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is a concern for me as CEO going forward, is that um, we potentially uh, will encounter a situation as that group of staff uh, move into their um, early, mid and late 60s, uh, that that capacity will be seriously reduced. The moment of what, uh, sorry, prior to pensions reform, what was, what was the upper age limit of, of, of staff? Um, 55. Staff 55. were retiring at 55, maximum 60. Right, OK. Turning to the issue of, of um, FEIs, um, obviously the, the Chief Inspector uh, alluded to a concern that she didn't have time to um, go into in any uh, great detail, but expressed a hope that she'd be able to, to do so in due course. We know uh, that there are concerns around delays uh, in, in FEIs. That's something that's been accepted <coughs> by the Cabinet Secretary and indeed uh, by the, the, the Lord Advocate. I think what is um, uh, almost as concerning is the concern that has certainly been raised by Katie Allen's uh, parents that even where FAIs have taken place, those recommendations or some of the recommendations from the, those FAIs have not been taken forward. Is that a concern that uh, has been raised uh, with you? Are you aware of the, 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 the details of, of, of those concerns? I'm, I'm aware of the, the, the concerns. Um, I think what would be helpful if the specifics of those recommendations could be set out. Um, I would be uh, very willing to, to have a look at what it is um, that a, a sheriff has determined that we have not uh, followed up on. Again, as I've said before, I give this committee an absolute assurance, uh, as, as we do with the Chief Inspector's uh, reports and recommendations or, or any other independent body, um, if a sheriff makes uh, recommendations in his de or her determination, then SPS will most certainly follow it through. And if indeed... Um, we, we have uh, not followed something through, then I would, I would want to know about what it is. Mm. Well, can, sorry, sorry. What can I say is between 2016 and 2018, there were 68 fatal accident <coughs> inquiries took place um, on deaths in custody, and of them, only two uh, were their recommendations from a sheriff. 
and others it was formal findings only. Right. I don't I mean it was relating more to the prison estate, but I don't know if, there, if that's a concern that's been expressed or, or is shared by those other witnesses. Yeah. Yes, um, I mean one of the things that's quite helpful for us within the secure estate, and although we're, you know, there are secure care standards pending, I think would, would be the best descriptor at the moment for them. But there are health and social care, health and social care, health and social care <laughs> standards which actually apply here. And one of the helpful things amongst those is within the section, how good is your staff team? Is there's the specific attention? which reflects the vulnerability of the MP that we're working with. And in essence, what it guides leaders and managers within secure care to do is to ensure, not, not that you're just meeting the, you know, the, the registrable minimals in terms of staffing with X amount of young people, but that also guides us to make sure that we have the right people in the right place at the right time with the right knowledge. Now, there's a variety of systems in which we do that. Um, most ostensibly, those are things like very clear um, mentoring systems so that people are actually performing some of these behaviours and picking up this knowledge as they go through their, their careers as residential care workers. There are also, throughout all the centres, very well established reflective supervision and appraisal systems that are actually checking that, that, they, that these things are in place. The care inspector is clear drive with this, so I think, is that. Um, from the young person's lens is that they need consistent, predictable staff providing their care. So if, as an agency, we are using too many sessional staff or too many staff on part-time contracts, or maybe therefore three of the set of six shifts, you know, that, that's something that we keep a, a really close weather down on because we know that these young people need consistent care we're predictable staff, we're relational-based agencies who are also informed by you know, trauma and attachment theory, which means that you know, we, we work hard to get the right people in the right place at the right time with the right skills. Right. Again, did you want to add something, Alison? David's just said everything <laughs> that I was going to say. Colin and Colin. So, so it would be um, trying to be helpful to, to, to Lee MacArthur. Um, in terms of your question about sheriff's determinations, uh, where a sheriff, as I understand it, I'm, I'm, I'm not legally qualified, but as I understand it, where a sheriff makes a formal determination and a recommendation associated with that, SPS is duty bound to write back uh, to the court uh, in relation to that uh, recommendation and confirm uh, that we have followed it through. Um, so again, I'm, I'm not aware uh, of any circumstances where we have not done that distinguished from formal findings, how would you expect to, to follow those through? So formal findings doesn't give any recommendation um, uh, from the Sheriff. However, uh, we actually do read all the FAIs and even where there's comment, we may take an action, but we've not actually been formally requested to. Uh, but as I say, there's only been two occasions in the last three years where um, the Sheriff has formally given recommendations and we had to formally respond um, and act on them. Okay, uh, Liam Kerr. This question again, please, Colin McConnell. Right, um, you say you welcome any direction. There is one at number three of the key recommendations in the report that I'm looking at, which says a bespoke suicide and self-harm strategy should be developed by the Scottish Prison Service. So my question is, is simply, do you agree with that statement? And if so, do you intend to do so? Convener, I'm being I'm being boxed in here, but. Um, in order that Mr Kerr doesn't accuse me of being defensive again uh, or, or avoiding the issue, then of course um, the, the recommendation as it's, as it's set out, um, we would totally embrace that recommendation and would look to move uh, forward on it um, to the satisfaction of, of the Chief Inspector in, in due course. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just ask, just to be... Absolutely clear, because I think there's something I'm missing here, Mr McConnell. Uh, when we were speaking earlier, is there a reason why you as Chief Executive won't comment on the, the, the report recommendations without having heard from the Cabinet Secretary? Specific things you have asked now, uh, Liam, and the, um, uh, Mr McConnell has given his response. 
and I don't think we're going to move any further than, than that on it. Um, but could I ha perhaps, and I apologise to the rest of the panel because this is a very big panel. Ideally, we would have had SPS separately and the assisted uh, places um, in another panel. Time constraints hasn't allowed that and we were very keen to hear from all of you. Um, just specifically, if not Ms McConnell, perhaps Leslie McDowell on the varying quality of data on suicide, the um, Chief Inspector has suggested that would be best asked to you given there's a variation between the Council of Europe suggesting that things were looking quite good and the Scottish uh, Centre of Crime and Justice Research saying this was um, positive, um, finding was challenged, an alternative analysis indicating Scotland may have one of the highest rates of suicide. Now she did qualify that quite rightly with the, the difficulty of extrapolating given the small numbers. So could I ask perhaps Leslie McDowell um, how, how you would address uh, the, the specific thing of the varying quality of data on suicide as it's so important that we get the best data, data to try and understand the extent of um, any potential problem. So um, we do analyse uh, the data that we have, but we would use um, the total number of um, people coming to, into custody over an, a, a year um, and not just on one specific day. Um, so um, the data that we have, we've had, um, we brought in an independent auditor to then verify our figures. And what we can say is, is um, where they'd said it was 125 per 100,000, um, for 2017 it was actually 41.4, um, and for uh, 2018 it was 44.5 per 100,000, um, because that's using um, the annual number of people coming into custody and not on one day, which is where we think uh, that figure has come from. Um, so we, we, our rates of suicide tend to be fairly static, um, and because the numbers are small, we look at it in a three-year rolling average rather than on an individual year. Um, one death can, can make a, a percentage mm -hmm. difference of 20%. Yeah. Um, so we do it over three years, and it tends to then sit between 8 and 11 um, over the last 10 years, uh, uh, over a three-year rolling average. That's, that's helpful. And, and specifically on the differing definitions of suicide, is that something you, you, you've, you've come across? That's been highlighted. So uh, we, we we will wait for the formal findings from a fatal accident inquiry before we determine if it is a, a death by suicide. We will we'll talk about apparent suicide, but the fatal accident inquiry uh, determination will determine if it was. Uh -huh. And do you think that's su sufficiently clear? That's a very sensible answer. Do you think that's uh, sufficiently clear that that's how you would address it, to be absolutely sure? W that's certainly how we, we, we have an external database that is accessible to the public. Um, and within that, we state that we wait on the formal findings because experience has shown us that that has our, our thought of, of the, the reason mm -hmm. that somebody died and what is, comes out from our determination has on occasions been different. So we wait on the formal finding. That's very helpful. Uh, Rona. Thank you. Um, yes, I'd like to ask about the funding and sustainability of secure care in Scotland. And if you could maybe explain the structures of that, because I know from the submissions that St Mary's is different. And perhaps, Carol, you could explain um, your funding structure and maybe incorporate the question of placements and referrals, etc., into that. Oh, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> it's not different in the sense that we're part of the secure care framework. That happened when we had to go out to tender um, in 2009-11. And what happened was a security care unit closed. From that point onward, um, we are in a contract with Scotland XL, which requires that um, every year on year, um, we have to put in a fee negotiation uplift for anything we want to do with the services for our young people, whether it be therapeutic, whether it be bringing in additional mental health services, whether it's paying staff, uh, a pay increase. Sorry, it's can, different for sorry, St Mary's. Carol, can you just explain what fee negotiation that would mean? Is sure, that like a budget apologies. Um, obviously, projection yeah, or something? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. what, what happens is that the contract says that we are allowed to ask for a slight increase to our bed. We all have different bed rates um, across Scotland, and we're not allowed to know what each, each other's bed rate is. That's not permitted. So we have no idea, I have no idea, for instance, what Good Shepherd or, or anybody has. 
So every year I put forward a presentation to Scotland XL that says that, for instance, you'll be aware that the teachers got a significant pay increase. Um, unfortunately, when we negotiated our pay increase on our bed rate to cover this, it had already gone in by the time that that was um, agreed. So what happens is that we have to go to a panel of people and if we want, for instance, and I'll be honest with this, uh, we asked for a 3.2% increase this year, and that was to cover additional therapeutic supports. It was to incl uh, include a 3% increase to staff, and it was to introduce one or two new um, posts that was going to enhance the outcomes of our kids. So every year on year, we go to these panels in total isolation from each other. We're asked various sets of questions. And then a decision is made whether or not we'll get it. If we don't get it, then that can have serious consequences on our service to our kids. Um, this year, we were not successful in getting it. Um, we got a mandated offer of a less um, a reduced percentage, which means that then I have to go in and cut the budget again. Um, and I think I said this, and I hope the committee appreciates it. It was as honest an answer as I could give. Um, was that I had to then go in and look at where I could make savings. And I did so on some things around the building. St Mary's is the oldest and the largest secure unit in Scotland. So by the very nature of that, requires a lot more uplift in terms of maintenance of, uh, and keeping it fit for purpose. So I had to go in and tweak that so that I could keep my kids getting what I believed they needed to have a quality experience while they were with us in St Mary's. I'm not so sure if the pressure continues to be that I can't get the bed uplift that I want, that the next decision is going to have to either be around reducing staffing or it's going to have to be around reducing the quality of the service. So it's, it's a very challenging model to be part of. And I also think that I, I can safely say that my colleagues feel that the fee negotiation is a bit like Oliver Twist, where he's bull asking for more, um, and it depends on, on the response to that. And that's difficult because what's happened is that kids have been commoditised. Our care has been commoditised. Our salaries are not the greatest. For You've heard what our staff are often um, working with some of the most complex kids in Scotland. So we try and, 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 and put a budget forward. I try and put a budget forward. It's very balanced. It keeps the kids at the centre of every decision. But getting that or not is up to other people. And that's a very, very difficult. And just finally to say that I was at a Scotland XL conference and I shared a table with people who tendered car parts, toilet rolls and confectionery for the prison service. And I'm sitting there talking about the quality of service to my kids. And there's something just not congruent with, okay. with that being, being, being about kids. And I have to be okay. quite... Can you explain a wee bit about the placement and referral and how that affects your, well, your, your, your funding and your service? Well, obviously, our spot purchases. Um, so uh, we get a call, uh, as we do um, many times, or we get a referral to say, do you have a bed available? Um, and we say yes or no, and we get that kid in. We often get that kid in with virtually no information or background information. It's an emergency placement. If the young person has went in remand, we're seeing an increase more in 16-year-olds to 18-year-olds going to Pullman instead of coming to us because the funding for remand is, is, is held at local authority level and not as it used to be up until 1996, which was uh, local government paid for remand. So the, the, the beds are spot purchases and we are a national service, which is for 32 local authorities. There was a significant decline in the number of beds that were being used in Scotland. Hence the reason why we uh, use cross-border placements was to keep us in business or we wouldn't be, I wouldn't be sitting in front of you today as St Mary's heads. And I think it might be safe to say, but um, I'll leave that to others. I think that definitely one unit would have closed, if not two. Um, and so the cross-border placements allowed us to stay, and I hate to use the word, but in business, it allowed us to do that. We've recently seen a, a significant increase again in Scottish beds um, being, being referred for. But the difficulty is that a lot of the placements are taken with cross-border kids who we gave a commitment to mm -hmm. providing a bed for. And we certainly don't know about the rest of the panel, but I'm not prepared to open the door and say, thanks very much. There's still a child, and, and there's a child in my care. Um, so there are challenges around, um, we don't know. If, if, if I said it was only going to be Scottish young people, I could sit for two weeks without getting a referral from Scotland. 
And that's a significant financial loss to, to St Mary's because St Mary's only is, at this moment in time, a secure, a secure provision in Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, so it's more difficult. Thanks, Carol. That's helpful. Would anyone else like to explain how, how it works for you? I just wanted to make a, a couple of additional comments. Um, when reading through the 299 pages of papers towards the, the, the committee hearing today, I was um, quite distressed, actually, at some of the language that was used when referring to us as secure care centres uh, in terms of the language, the, the business language that was used and regarding us as a market um, and almost equating children's lives to a kind of a supply and demand situation, which I find um, very, very difficult. Um, we are all not-for-profit organisations with a long history of the delivery of residential school care uh, for troubled children and children in need, and that is how we operate. And we're underpinned by um, charitable values and missions um, in legislation, and we're governed by OSCAR regulations. So I would hope the committee bears that in mind in terms of some of the submissions that have come from, from other partners, particularly in relation to health and mental health. Um, are the committee aware that the way it works in terms of the spot purchase um, contract framework that Carol's described, uh, the NHS are not partners within that. So in terms of the commissioning of secure care services for Scotland's most vulnerable children, that is an agreement between the 32 local authorities. They commission our services via Scotland Excel as the purchasing um, agency, if you like, who brokers uh, those arrangements between Scottish Government for young people who are placed um, on sentence and in certain other uh, situations and the 32 local, local authorities for children placed on remand or children placed through the children's hearing system which is the vast vast majority of Scottish children who come into secure care come in through the, the, the children's hearing system. So it seems um, quite ironic really with all the emphasis on a trauma-informed approach, um, the implementation of the NEST framework in terms of trauma, skills and knowledge, which we are all implementing across our secure care centres, um, GERFEC and the whole agenda around holistic approaches and corporate parenting for these children and young people that health are not part of that commissioning process. So you then end up in a, in a strange situation where each individual secure care centre is negotiating with the host um, NHS um, Health Board, and then also negotiation, negotiating in terms of uh, the other 13 health boards, depending on where children are placed from. Um, and in terms of the level of service that's provided, there's no national agreement that sets out a framework that says you must have the equivalent of 0 0.5 of a consultant psychiatrist, or that you must have uh, qualified clin uh, clinical and forensic psychology or a CPN or somebody specialising in CBT or other forms of uh, therapeutic intervention and treatment. And that's something really that secure care centres have developed themselves. It's the secure care sector that has led on that and that has driven that. It's not come from the statutory services. We'll move on a little bit to procurement. And before we left the cross-border issue, that was your line of questioning, um, Photon. So do you have anything to add? I know John and Liam MacArthur have both supplementaries. Yeah, no, it was, uh, thanks, Convener. It was just um, on the referral process generally. We were talking there about uh, local authority referrals and, uh, and likewise. Uh, do you feel that referrals from local authorities are increasing or decreasing over the years for secure placements? It very much fluctuates throughout the years. At the moment, it's on, on increase in terms mm. of Scottish referrals. OK, and, and can, can you maybe comment a wee bit on the children's hearing, the, the children's hearing process within that? I mean, I, I, as a, a declaration of interest, a, a ex-social worker myself, I worked in children and families for, um, for 12 years, and uh, I was involved often in the referral to, to secure placements and such like. But um, I, I know that the children's hearing system had a, a very big role in it, and... Reflecting on my own experience, even you know, when I started around about 2004, it, children's hearing system, the children's hearing panels were quite um, often quite keen to just say, yeah, we'll recommend secure. But that sort of changed over time, I felt, maybe 07, 08, 09, that kind of time, when directors of social work became more involved. I, I'm wondering if there's any comment can be made on that. Well, certainly the children's hearing system can make a secure care authorisation 
Um, whether that secure care authorisation is taken up by the Chief Social Work Officer is, is another story. And quite often, young people that do require that level of intensive support within secure care quite often don't reach a secure care centre um, and often are, are looked after within the community. Um, and quite often that can escalate, you know, their behaviours can escalate within the community to quite a high degree, and then it's, it becomes an emergency situation where they have to then be placed within se the secure care setting. So. And in terms of thresholds, there's no commissioning model. So there's a commissioning model which is really around procurement. It's not a commissioning cycle, and it certainly doesn't look at the commissioning of individual placements in terms of a hierarchy of need, if you like. So what happens in, in the current situation, um, the secure care centres in Scotland have been pretty much full um, for several months now, which can lead to really distressing situations where local authorities, social workers and placing officers are phoning around the secure care centres who are part of the national contract, desperate for a placement for a vulnerable young person. Uh, but there's no kind of centralised mechanism for the management of that. Nobody's screening that. Nobody has a national um, overview of, that, of all of that data. Um, so the same person could be phoning around about the same young person to all of the centres over the course of several days, but there's no mechanism for actually then mapping that and looking at um, you know, rising levels of need. It's the secure care centres themselves who are monitoring, who are monitoring that. Okay, and just one further question. Convener, a supplementary, supplementary. Yeah. Um, it talked a wee bit about the, um, the cross-border uh, secure placements. And I just wanted to explore that a wee bit, if you feel there's been a, a, a rise, a, a, a decline overall in, in, in perhaps uh, Scottish children um, coming to placement as opposed to other parts of the UK. And, and I say that because um, in my own experience, again, I remember as a social worker, having to travel, and I can't remember the name of it now, but having to travel down to a place in the northeast of England, just outside Newcastle, eh, on several occasions because there was no placements. There was, there was no placements in Scotland, and it seems now to be the other way. Is there any comments on, on that? Things that's really important to inform the committee. There was a massive, massive drive on looking at alternatives to secure care, mm -hmm. and we understand the reasons for that. Locking a child up should be um, a very difficult decision to make. Um, so there should be, a, in the children's hearing access, you have to look at a lot of alternatives before you come to us. What we think has happened is that, that in actual fact, a lot of those alternatives, in actual fact, are meaning that young people are out in the community a lot longer um, and they're presenting much more complex to us. On the other side, though, in England, you have the use of secure care being used much earlier. And the English social, social work local councils down there and local authorities tell us they're in an absolute awe of the secure units in Scotland. Absolute awe. They've never seen anything like it. So there is a rise on the use of secure referrals to Scotland, and this is my opinion, because they're accessing a service that doesn't exist in England. Yeah. While Scotland, there is a decrease in referrals because of the alternative to secure care, um, alternatives that's been pursued. What's happened is those alternatives aren't working, so we're seeing a rise again in Scottish referrals. But for me, certainly, as it may, there's a consistent number of referrals from cross-border. I think you were saying this morning you had yep. nine in, in two days or something. I could equally get maybe 20, 25 referrals in a week from cross-border um, because they have absolutely nothing like this. In their words, not mine, in Scotland. So I think that's one of the reasons you see a rise in cross-border cross placements. Thank you. Yeah. John Thanks, Finney. Can, I, can I just comment, oh, that just to say that that was... Uh, my main line of questioning, not supplementary. So well, that's, just wanted to that's that. why um, your supplementaries did take quite a time and I actually brought you in to um, continue your main line of questioning. So you confused us wonderfully. For your film. No, <laughs> John Finney. Thank you. It's largely been covered by Fulton and, and indeed by what Ms Deary said there, but I wonder if I must just clarify one point. As a former local authority councillor, there was a, se a cell um, made in papers that talked about taking children back in to, to the, the authority area. Um, I would like to think that was entirely driven by uh, the needs of the child. I suspect the bank balance was having a, a factor to play there. But I want to pick up on the point where you said that you're now finding that emergency admissions are people perhaps who are at a more advanced stage of complex needs 
than may have once been the case. Is that correct? Oh, I, well, that's my opinion. <clears throat> Young people who are coming into secure care now are much more complex. <clears throat> and when you look at their history, you can see that had they perhaps um, had some interventions much earlier on, um, then we would have seen less of that. In my opinion, the young people coming in to certainly to St Mary's um, are far, far more complex, far more challenging, and in most cases a lot more violent than what we've ever been used to. Uh, we're seeing some really incredible levels of violence. Um, I don't know necessarily that anybody around this, this panel here beside me would say that they have an answer to that, but there is clearly a pattern developing and an increase in young people coming into secure care who are much more, more challenging and complex um, in Scotland, Scottish referrals. If I may, are you able to suggest that perhaps there are people who are being housed in residential accommodation within authorities who would be better placed in uh, secure accommodation? Do I have any evidence? Yeah. No, it's really it's my view um, of, of, of a number of decades of experience in this work. I don't know. Um, I, I think that there are young people where, and, and I, I want to just kind of I just conclude by saying I'm not, I, I am not saying that we shouldn't be pursuing alternatives to secure, even though I'm a, a head of a secure service. The vision for Scotland is that we have a, a Scotland that doesn't take the liberty away from young people. Um, but when we do, then we need to make sure it's very therapeutic. I do believe there are young people who are in uh, residential placements across Scotland who and who are on secure orders. We know recently, or I know recently, of two young people who are placed in secure orders who are out in the community for, for, for attempted murder and murder uh, and who were high court bailed. So I think that there are, there are concerns around the housing of these young people and trying every single thing to do before the legislation says we are the last resort. That's what the legislation calls us. We are the last resort, so there is a much more emphasis on doing things in the community before coming to us. But that, that's very good that the last resort is to put someone in secure accommodation, mm -hmm. regardless of their age. Um, I'm concerned, and, and rightly, that uh, you know the commendable work that all your, your institutions do, uh, the business parlance does seem to, to take place when we're talking about procurement and the yep. like. Um, are, are you concerned that there are people who should be in your care who are not for simply local authority funding? Yes. Okay. And in that point, yes. in terms of the fact that local authorities can determine whether young people that are on remand are placed within Polmont or within secure care services. And obviously the difference in cost between sending a young person to um, Polmont and sending a young person to one of the secure services is, is, is quite significant. So in terms of that, that wasn't always the case. Previously, the Scottish Government um, funded remand placements, in which case then the local authorities didn't have that responsibility. But when a local authority is faced with budgetary constraints, then it has to take these things into consideration when it's got a young person that is on remand and whether it sends a young person to a secure unit, a 16-year-old or a 16-year-old child to a prison. Yeah. And that's a difficult decision to make. But Added into that problem is the fact that when, when that young person has mental health difficulties, mm -hmm. what decision is that local authority going to make? A young person that's 16 years of age who is actually still a child and has got mental health difficulties, whether that local authority sends a young person to Pullman, where the ratio, staff-child ratio, is, I believe, 12 to 1, mm -hmm. or sends a young person to secure care services where the ratio can at time is 3 to 1, but more often 2 to 1. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Liam McCarthy. <coughs> Following up on that, Ms. Thierry, you were talking about there not being effectively the equivalent of the same sort of secure um, uh, care services south of the border. From that, um, does that imply that the, the, the cross-border pl placement process is only working one way? Are we still seeing evidence of local authorities seeking to, 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 to place in units um, south of the border? No, so it's working. It's working one way. It's going to work one yeah, way. it's it's from cross border to us in Scotland, and what we also yeah. find is that uh, young people in secure have an average stay of fifteen weeks, um, and um, cross border it's nine months. I think they're covered. That. So uh, and their transitions, leaving secure care, are much more stringent, robust, and effective, whereas a lot of our young people who leave secure end up in homeless accommodation. 
So there are clear differences in how uh, cross-border placements um, are, 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 are utilised as opposed to the Scottish ones. So from that you're saying actually what's available by way of secure units in, in Scotland is, is, is far better than what's available. Far better. So, that's but actually the, the process of transitioning through that... It's also better. Is, it's also better. Also, yeah. yeah. Thanks. The, uh -huh, yes, I just wanted to make the point that there, is, that, that there are real differences at the moment in terms of the proportion of young people placed from England in the different secure care centres who are part of the national contract. Um, and the overall trend has been that there's been a significant increase in referrals and placement of Scottish young people within secure care. So um, at the Good Shepherd Centre, for example, we have a very, very small number of, of young people now in our secure care centre, whereas last year there were over half of the young people um, in secure care were placed there from England. Uh, there's clearly a lot um, on the procurement processes. Is there anything you haven't mentioned and you want to, to write in additionally to your um, mm. submission, please feel free to do so. Rona. Yeah, I'd like to ask about the pathways and destinations of young people leaving secure care. Um, I think I might be right in thinking the new um, legislation for looked after people doesn't extend to uh, people leaving care. So can anyone comment on whether you think... Um, there is a, a satisfactory structure for this. It is we seriously let our young people down. I think there is a, a massive issue and effective and robust transitions. I think one of the best ways that you evidence that is to give a real example. I have a young girl leave, having, having carried out a two-year sentence who is about to leave early June. And the only place being considered is a homeless hostel at 17 years of age. Now, anybody who tells me that's an effective transition is not only letting that kid down, but it's letting our country down because our kids deserve better. They are the most vulnerable. Yet time and time and time again, and I know that I, speak, I, I would happily speak for everybody at this point, we see our kids leaving our secure environment, very nurturing, um, and they leave us, and they leave us to, to environments where they're, they're vulnerable again, they're exposed again, and it's an absolute disgrace. Anyone else like to comment? I'd well, just endorse the points mm -hmm. that Carol's made. I think that would be a shared view from, from Rossi as well. OK, thank you. On that very concerning note, can I thank all the witnesses for attending? This has been a very powerful and useful evidence session. Um, I'm now going to suspend briefly to allow the witnesses to leave.
Our final agenda item is consideration of petition 1458. The petition is from Mr Peter, Peter Cherby and asks the committee to consider the merits of establishing a register of interest for members of the judiciary. I refer members to paper four. Since we considered this petition last time, we've received additional information from Mr Cherby and also from Moyali. Uh, we have also received a letter from the Cabinet Secretary for Justice. Um, can I invite comments uh, for, from members on the correspondence and whether they wish to, um, to make any recommendations or um, suggest further action? John Finney. Thank you. I, I think it's, uh, it's very helpful to have all this information here and there's a number of suggestions. I, I, I for one, feel I, I can't understand what the problem would be with having a register and, and, and the more people tell me there's no issue, uh, the more I'm convinced that there is a need for one. Um, I think the submission from Moyali is very helpful and there's reference to a letter. That, ref that letter's uh, 23rd April 2014. That's now a bit old. We've also been provided with news coverage. I have to say the idea that anyone connected with the Scottish judiciary would have any role whatsoever in the United Arab Emirates. I went on yesterday to Human Rights Watch World Report, which does a country-by-country -country breakdown. There's a country that's intolerant of criticism, that's uh, played a leading role in the uh, unlawful acts in Yemen, its treatment of uh, migrant workers, women's rights um, uh, is absolutely shocking. It permits domestic uh, violence. I don't think any reasonable examination of the, the role of a, a public official, and I get the separation of the judiciary, would say that that's acceptable. So um, I think we need to do something, and I'm not content with the Cabinet Secretary's response. I think it's just playing out the same line before, that there's nothing to see here and move on. Well, I don't think this issue will move on until we have the openness and transparency that people rightly expect of public office. Daniel Johnson. I'd like to speak in support of what uh, my colleague John Finney has, has just said. The, the Nolan Principles are 25 years old this year, um, and they are principles which I think have guided public life very well. In particular, uh, three of those principles are, one, integrity, whereby holders of public offices should not place themselves under any financial or other obligation to outside individuals or organisations that might seek to influence them in the performance of their official duties, openness, which I think is self-explanatory, and honesty, whereby holders of public offices have a duty to declare any private interest relating to their public duties and to take steps to resolve any conflicts arising in any way, uh, in a way that protects the public interest. I, I think that's pretty clear. And I think while the Cabinet Secretary may well not view that there is a problem, that is not to say that this is not a positive step to ensuring that we have an open, transparent, and an all above uh, a judiciary that is, uh, you know, whose integrity is beyond question. So I absolutely believe in the independence of the, the judiciary, but I think in order to maintain that integrity and that independence, this uh, step in terms of transparency has an awful lot of merit. And I, I think the committee should think about taking uh, perhaps some further evidence, certainly uh, hearing from White Alley, which such as the suggestion from the petitioner, but I think this is something that we should progress and, and, and uh, seek to, uh, to, to move forward. Thank you. Uh, Lee MacArthur? Yeah, can I very much echo what um, Daniel Johnson has said and, and much of what John Finney has said. I think in, in reference to the United Arab Emirates, while I might share many of his concerns, I think the point about a register is, is illuminating that. And, and, and if there's a justification in engaging in order to improve the way in which uh, judicial procedures operate in a, in a third country, uh, then at least we all know what the purpose of, of that engagement is. But I, I, I mean, I, again, I think I, I would very much uh, concur with, with, with what's been said about um, uh, the, 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 uh, the need for, for transparency, the, the uh, underpinnings of the, of the Nolan principles. I mean, I, I see from the Court and Tribunal Service um, the, uh, the, the details of the accountability uh, report. I'm not sure that that is a massive leap um, away from what is being um, sought through this petition, and therefore this may be a bit of a journey that, 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 that they're on, but I, I would certainly agree that um, it would be worth the committee uh, continuing to, to pursue this to take further evidence from Moy Ali. That would seem a logical um, next step, as, as John Finney suggested, the earlier evidence she provided 
Um, it was in written form. It was um, a, a number of weeks ago. I think it would probably benefit uh, us all to, to hear um, what she has to say and cross-examine that uh, a, a little further. But I would be um, very keen to keep this petition open for, for now. Liam Kerr. Uh, just briefly to say I'm pretty much in the same place on this. Uh, I can see the argument why we would take this further and why we should hear more. Uh, I look at the response from the Cabinet Secretary and the uh, reference to the previous um, Cabinet Secretaries saying, look, I, I don't think there's anything to, to examine particularly here. And I'm just not persuaded, having felt that... Or, considered the force of argument in favour of exploring it further, I'm not convinced that it's good enough to just say, look, there's nothing here, don't worry about it. Um, and so for that reason, I think we should be looking in more detail at this. Fulton? Yeah, thanks, Convenors. I think just to echo what others have said, I think that um, it looks like, you know, I think John, uh, John Finney particularly made a, a very uh, compelling argument about why we should do something further than this. I'm not sure that uh, some people have commented on the Cabinet Secretary's response, and I'm not sure that that was my taking uh, uh, in what he was saying, that it was uh, it was nothing um, to see here sort of thing. But but even even given that, I think that, you know, really we should be taking more uh, evidence and, and information to work out where we go from here. So I agree with what's been said. Any other views? Right. Can I summarise then, um, Moya Ali? Um, I think the cabinet, uh, the committee, was keen to to hear from. Uh, she her her submission or letter was dated 2014, but she did say it was relevant. It would be good to get an update. Um, the Nolan Committee, I think, we've expressed is 25 years old, so perhaps it is time that we, we take some evidence from perhaps Lord Calloway, if he's pre prepared to give a, a view, the petitioner himself, most certainly, and um, the Cabinet Secretary to give him uh, an opportunity to respond more fully to the letter he sent us. And if there's any other witnesses, it would be September now we'd be looking to do this. Uh, we are agreeable. That's how we move forward. OK, we are. That uh, brings this meeting to a close. Our next meeting will be on the 4th of June when we'll begin our consideration of a statutory instrument setting out the Scottish Government's plans on a presumption against short sentences. And I now formally close this meeting. <laughs>